20 minutes late yesterday, so let's try and make up for that last time. Do I have any questions um, with regards to um, yesterday's lecture before we move on? Are there any questions? Did you think or ponder about anything that was said? And you may have some questions that you wish me to answer. Now is your time. Okay, that's that. So tonight we will start with letters of demand and notices. Now remember, um, yesterday when we ended, you were in your consultation. Remember, we were at the pre-litigation stage. We, we covered everything, um, the sources of high court practice, the officials of the court. Um, yeah. Now you are in your consultation and you decide that you're going to write a letter of demand. Now, when would you write a letter of demand? Well, now, all of you know, you remember from your school days how to write a letter. It has a beginning, a middle and an end. Nothing is different. It's still the same. You have the introduction, you the middle, what you tell the people, what it's about, and then the conclusion at the end. The letter. It's on the attorney's letterhead, right? So a demand is essential in certain cases. Right. Um, first of all, to place a debtor in mora. This is necessary when no time for performance has been agreed between the parties. Now, once the period um, that is in the demand, once that expires, then the debt becomes due and interest begins to run. And then interest also continues at the rate applicable in terms of the prescribed rate of interest act, which is now 10.25. OK, so. If you send a letter of demand, one of the advantages of sending a letter of demand means that you can claim interest from an earlier date from the date when your letter of demand was sent. You also send a letter of demand so that interest can be claimed. Um, yeah, I've already said that. So, um, yeah, in terms of the um, prescribed rate of interest amendment act. Interest can be claimed on unliquidated debits. Deb, sorry, from demand or from summons, whichever date is the earliest. When the creditor intends to cancel a, a contract, an agreement, then um, and the parties have not agreed on 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 that on a right of immediate cancellation, then um, in the letter of demand you must request performance within a reasonable time, and then you warn the party that non-performance will lead to the cancellation of the contract. OK, so so that is another instance. Um, if the creditor intends to cancel or non-compliance, now if a letter of demand was sent and the creditor was told to. Um, was told to to do certain things within a certain time limit and he didn't do and now the agreement must be cancelled, then you can cancel it in a further letter of demand or you can cancel it in the summons. You can ask that the court um, orders that the agreement is cancelled. Also to complete a cause of action. OK, so I'm going to, to go into more depth with you with what is causes of action. But just remember um, some a cause of action. Is a set of facts which give rise to a to a right. And this, yeah, I'm going to go into depth with it, into depth with, the, with you with that later. <laughs> Just remember to complete the cause of action, you need to send a letter of demand in the case of a credit agreement. So if the parties had entered into a credit agreement, before you can issue a summons, before the cause of action is complete, the National Credit Act provides that the creditor must send a notice in terms of Section 129, as read with Section 130 of that Act, before enforcing a debt. Okay. So, yeah. Then, 
be, before action against the state, that's also at or provincial or local authority. We are also going to depth with that um, to complete the cause of action when you must send a letter of demand. Now you will see those acts, the National Credit Act and the Act applicable to the state, um, which is the institution of legal proceedings against certain organs of the state act. That act refers to a notice, but that notice is the letter of demand. So don't think a notice is something different but they refer to you as a letter of demand. It falls under letter of demand because it is actually a letter of demand. Although the heading of the notice um, in terms of section 129, I will say notice in terms of 126 and 129 of the National Credit Act, it, it is still a letter of demand. Okay. So in terms of this act, um, if you are going to claim against the state, it can be provincial government, it can be... Um, national government and it can be local government. They are all states. And then there's a certain parastatals that also are organs of state or considered organs of state. And if you are going to sue them, then you have to first send them a letter of demand in terms of Act 40 of 2002. Okay, so what that Act does, it consolidates the notice and time limit requirements contained in a variety of other statutes. So they've con consolidated everything. And if you bring civil action against the state, that can be national, provincial, or local government. So the local government would be your municipalities, provincial government, national government, or any institution that exercises a function in terms of the constitution. So those um, institutions that exercise a function in terms of the constitution, before you sue them, you must also first send them a letter of demand or a notice in terms of the institution of legal proceedings against certain organs of the State Act 40 of 2002 and the section is a section 3 notice they say right so um so certain um institutions um the public protector who else um um institutions exercising a function in terms of the constitution the Human Rights Commission, all of those kinds of institutions, um, they are regarded as an organ of state and therefore you have to comply with that act. Right, <clears throat> South African Maritime Safety Authority, South African National Road Agency Limited, or any person for whose debt or organ of state is liable. For all of that, you send a section three notice. Okay. So um, basically no legal proceedings for the recovery of a debt may be instituted against such organs unless the creditor has been given notice in writing of the intention to institute legal proceedings or the organ of state has consented in writing to the institution of legal proceedings. Now, um, remember we are talking about letters of demand and I said um, this section deals with to complete a cause of action. So if you didn't send this notice, and you institute legal proceedings, you issue a summons, then that means your summons was premature because there's no cause of action yet. The cause of action is not completed. Right. The notice must briefly set out the facts giving rise to the debt and the particulars of the debt. So the notice is not something that you will merely pay lip service to because the act says you must send a notice and now you just send the notice um, in terms of the act. Just to comply, that is not the intention of it. The intention of the notice is to place the um, organ of the state in a position where they can look at your claim and decide whether they are going to allow you to go to court or are they going to try and settle out of court at that stage, which means that you must place them in a position where they can then make an informed decision. So you will have to, in that letter of demand, give them as much information as possible as to how the claim arose, how did you come to the amount that you say you are claiming. So everything that you would put, for example, in a particular soft claim, you would put in that letter of demand. And then they um, they have 60 days in which to, to um, this is supposed to be 60 days and not 30 days. OK, um, the 30 days is incorrect. So the notice must be served on the organ of state within six months from the date the debt become due. 
and no court processes can be served on the organ of state before 60 days has elapsed since the demand was served. So it's 60 days, eh? Since 2017, the act was, um, I, I thought I changed it, but the change probably didn't take effect. Um, and then uh, section four of the act is how it can be served, can even be served by email on the organ of state. So just remember, if you have a claim against an organ of state within six months of the cause of action arising, you must send a notice to the organ of state to say, I'm going to claim from you this. This is what happened. This is this is what I'm going to claim. This is why I'm going to claim it. And then if within 60 days they didn't respond, then only can you issue summons because then the cause of action was complete. OK. Um, yeah, I thought I'd taken that off. This is just in general information. It's not in your notes. OK, the National Credit Act 34 of 2005, um, the section 21, 29 notice, which I referred to earlier. Now, a credit provider, this is now if you entered into a credit agreement. Most common credit agreements is an, you apply for a credit card, you apply for a loan from the bank, you apply for a um, car loan to buy a car, you apply for a bond, that kind of credit agreement. Now, if I yes. may interrupt you, yes, I just want to check as you before you proceed. Um, in relation to the issue of the letter of demand, uh, whether it's per the contract or is by the act that we have quoted, when you have to, you know, approach an organ of state if there's something that has happened which needs a, a, a some kind of an action. Uh, I just okay. want to check that. Okay. Uh, yes, I want to check that. It means that it's not compulsory for one to respond to a letter of demand. So you will not be. OK, violated. you're asking me many questions. I'm um, usually in cross examination. The judge will say one question at a time so that the witness can okay, answer let me, you. Let me, <laughs> and, let, let, yes. me, let me summarize it in this way. Uh, that a letter of demand, it's not compulsory to respond. No, it is. It is. That part okay. you are wrong. It, in terms of the of the um, institution of legal proceedings against certain organs of the state act, it is compulsory in terms of that act. If you are going to claim against the state or an organ of state, then you must send a notice in terms of section three, which is the letter of demand. OK, so you can now go on I, with you. Now, what I mean is if, if you send a letter of demand to the organ of state and the organ of state does not respond to the letter of demand, there is nothing against the, uh, you know, you can claim because they, they didn't or they, they didn't you break are, any yes. law. Also, you can, you can the then is, uh, yes. comments with yes. the, the summons. With the proceed, yes, the act says they have 60 days in which to, um, to respond to that letter of demand. If 60 days have passed, then and nothing has happened, then you can institute proceedings, then you can sue them, then you can issue summons. No, thanks. OK, was there another part of the question? Is no, no, or did no, I answer it? Yes, thanks. Yes. Now, um, in terms of Section 129 of the National Credit Act 34 of 2005, a credit provider, which would be the bank or a credit provider that has been registered as a credit provider, may not enforce a credit agreement unless a notice has been delivered to the consuming Sorry, to the consumer setting out the default of the consumer and drawing the consumer's attention to his or her rights. So if you are going to sue somebody based on a credit agreement, you can't just issue summons because they are in default. You must first send them this um, notice in terms of Section 129. And in this notice, which is a letter of demand, in this letter of demand, you will give them certain uh, um, options. And it is compulsory that you give them the options. The options is that they can go to the credit ombud, that they can go for debt review, or that they can bring the arrears up to date. Uh, not bring the arrears up to date, make arrangements to bring the arrears up to date. OK, if they do one of those things. Within the time allocated that they get, um, I'll show you now it's 10 days. If they do that, then you can't issue summons. So you first must you must first send them this letter, this notice, before you issue summons. 
if you didn't send this notice and you issue summons, then the cause of action is incomplete and that is a premature summons. Then um, they can raise a special a special plea to that. OK. And um, I'm sorry, advocate, is that uh, cause of action or process of action? OK, I, I, I'm a bit lost. You say, is it a cause of action or a process yeah, of action? It's, it's, what yeah, do you mean? Summons or what you call summons, is it a process or a cause of action? Process. In the process, you will, in the summons, you will describe the cause of action. OK. The reason for why. But you call it, it's a process, yes. The summons yes. is a process, yes. 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 OK. OK. Thanks. Yes, so um, remember it's in section, in terms of section 129 of the National Credit Act, read with section 30, and this is the compulsory part that must be included in the notice. It um, it states that they must, um, that they have the option of going for debt counselling, that they can go for alternative dispute resolution, they can go to the consumer court or to the ombud with the intent that any dispute be resolved, or that a plan be agreed upon by the parties to bring the payments up to date. So they get the opportunity then to do one of those things, and you must include this in the notice. And um, so if they're in default, you send them that notice, you draw their um, attention to the default, and um, you cannot commence with legal proceedings. You can't issue summons unless you have done that. Right? And if they exercise one of those options, then you can't issue summons. If they say I'm going for debt review or oh, I'm going to the credit ombud, or if they if you agree on a plan to bring the areas up to date, then then you can't issue summons. Right? So at least 10 business days must have elapsed if you want to issue summons since the credit provider delivered a notice um, to the consumer as contemplated in those sections of the Act. Right. Now, what happened in the past is that, um, especially with bonds, people were in default um, with paying their bond repayments, and then the bank now wants to sue them. So the bank sends them the Section 129 notice, um, and it must be sent by registered post. That is what the Act says. So the bank sends it to them by registered posts. Um, they get the slip from the post office. And then they don't go and collect the letter because they know they are in arrears. And then on the day when the um, bank is in court, the credit provider is in court to ask for default judgment um, because they uh, they issued summons now and they now in court. Then the credit provider says no, but this summons, sorry, this summons is um. Premature. And it shouldn't have been given because I didn't receive a letter of demand. I didn't receive a letter of demand. I didn't receive a notice. And then because I didn't receive a notice, um, and and the credit provider didn't have proof that a notice was was given because they didn't go and collect the letter. So the court says, um, You um that this is not what the court said. That is so that that it must be served by registered mail. But here the court says where the credit provider posts the notice, the proof of the register dispatched to the address of the consumer, together with proof that the notice reached the appropriate post office for delivery to the consumer, will in the absence of contrary indication constitute sufficient proof of delivery. So what that means is the following. What the credit provider then sends the letter by registered post, right? The post office then brings the postman. I don't know how we can rely on the postman, but this is how this is ideally how it should be. The postman comes with a slip. The person don't collect the letter. What the credit provider must then provide the court is that proof. So he will go to the post office website. And then he will print out a track and trace report. Now, if the track and trace report shows that the letter, in fact, reached the post office in the in the jurisdiction where that person resides, irrespective of you when to go and fetch it or not, if it reached the post office, then it's deemed that the letter was delivered. So people couldn't come and say, 
I didn't receive the letter because they woefully did not go and collect the letter. They couldn't come with that excuse anymore because if the letter was delivered at the post office and there's proof of that, which the credit provider must attach, then that was sufficient um, to prove that there was, in fact, um, service of the notice of in terms of Section 129. Okay. And remember, in credit agreements, usually one of the stipulations in a credit agreement is that the defendant must choose a domicilium sitandi et executandi. That is the place where they will um, where they will receive further processes and letters and no notices in the matter. So um, that if it is sent to that address, the post office in that area, that is sufficient. So the risk of risk of non receipt rests squarely with the defendant. Okay, and uh, I just have some cases there that where it is, right? That is just um, a letter of demand that you had to draft. If we were now in a classroom situation, but we're not. But um, I will see to that you get the slide, so you will see that example. All right? Do I have any questions on a letter of demand? Remember, the normal letter of demand is to place the data in Mora, to cancel a contract, all of those, um, and to claim interest from an earlier date. And then we have the statutes that come that you compulsory requirements for serving a letter of demand to complete a cause of action. Right. And the two that we are dealing with is the institution of legal proceedings against certain organs of the State Act and the National Credit Act. Are there any questions around that? I have a question. Sure, ask. I wanted to find out what if the client uh, moved? Let's say maybe the client is no longer residing in that address and the section 129 letter was sent to that address. What is the client's recourse? Yeah, you see, um, if the client um, in the National Credit Act, are you talking about the National Credit Act, the section 129 notice? Yes, the section 129. Yeah. What if it's delivering the address and the client law no longer resides there? Like when the parties entered into an agreement, one of the stipulation of the agreement was that he gives an address as domicilium et executandi. Now you would see that that is also qualified by the next stipulation. It will also say that should the domicilium et executandi change, it is um, at the uh, data must in writing inform the credit provider from the of the change of address otherwise it is deemed that he still resides there so they are covered by that you will see in all the credit agreements they usually say if you are a domicilium it executed and it changed you must inform them in writing of the new address so if you move you must let them know okay thank you okay any other questions Yes, ma'am. Yes, you can ask. Yes, with regard to the condonation, does it have also um, a, a, a period where, where, where it uh, it lapses? It can I can I file um, a condonation um, a, a procedure after maybe after a year or a year and a half after that sixty days? Well, in practice, people have filed condonations years after after it and it depends on um look if you bring an application for condemnation then you must obviously show the court um in your application in your affidavit you must show the court what is the reason for the delay and if your reason is understandable and it's a good reason Why? then the no, court no, may no, come excuse me did someone say something Um, yes, you must um, in your application for condemnation, you must then tell the court what the reason for the delay is. How long is the delay? Is it an unreasonable delay? And um, what is your chances of success? That is also what you go into when you bring an application for condemnation, because if your chances of success in your claim is not great, then it's no use the court granting you condemnation. So you have to go in all that. Um, there's no time limit as to when you can you can try your luck for as long is it if you if you have a reasonable explanation um there was um a few cases and i i recall one in medical negligence when this person had an injury and it was years after sorry not injury 
the person underwent an operation and years after the operation, um, he had problems. Now, he didn't know that the problems that he had was as a result of what occurred during that operation. Only once he went to a specialist. Now, this didn't manifest immediately, as you will know, it will manifest later. And only when he went to go and see a specialist, the specialist tell him, look, when they um, when they operated on you at that time, they were negligent because they didn't do the things as they were supposed to do. So the duty of care um, was not adhered to. And therefore, um, they are responsible for the pain that you're feeling. And um, in that case, um, there is no six months. And then the court say, when did it come to your attention? And it came to his attention when the specialist told him that they were negligent. And from there, the six months starts running. So it depends on the circumstances. And then in the application for condemnation, you must explain that. Okay. Thank you very that was a, yeah. No, thank you very much. Understood. Thanks. Okay, sure. Any other questions? Uh, uh, yes, advocate. Um, <clears throat> with regards to the section one to nine notice, mm -hmm. um, I just want to find out that um, does the act stri strictly say that you must um, you must deliver the the notice via registered mail or let's it's say it's in that court know, case. It's in that court case when the court said that um, I had it on. Let me just go back there. Um, Rousseau, it's the SCA. The legislator was said that sending a document by registered mail is proper, proper delivery. The legislator grant the customer the right to choose the manner of delivery, place the risk of non received on the customer's shoulders. Yes, but my question was that does, does it does it only accept uh, the method of registered post or let's let's say if you know an email address of the data. So you cannot send um, it via the email. No, no email address. How do you, how do you have? How are you going to prove that the person in fact received the email address? The email. What if it went to spam? Because I've had in practice, I've had cases like that where people say the the mail went to spam and they never read the mail. And obviously, it must be sent to the domicilium. Remember, we're talking about credit agreements, so it is an agreement that is in writing. Party signed it. Oh, oh yes. So, so the the domicilium sitandi at executandi must have been part yeah. of the agreement. It's part of the, the the credit agreement. It would usually be part of it. Look, um, for what 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 credit providers do? Banks also they send the registered letter, but they also would send an email just to notify you. But I mean, that is not the proper one. The one that is sent by registered mail that is the proper one. But they do um will also sometimes email you. Uh, so, so the the email would just be for the purpose of courtesy, not not to say yeah. it's the part of the. Yeah, just All so right. that you know, if in case you missed it, yeah. All right. But Thanks. I mean, they don't have to. I'm <laughs> sending it by email, and um, yeah, but I see banks; they also send it by email. Mm. But um, it, it specifically in 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 the section one twenty nine notice, what the credit provider does um when they issue summons, they must um attach proof that it was served at the post office, so they must have the track and trace um, print out attached and the letter of demand plus the slip, the registered post slip. So all of that must be attached, so emails won't work for that. No, it's understood. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay, so then um, I'm coming to attorney's mandate. Now, the attorney's mandate, um, it's a mandate is, is um, remember, in you, you in your consultation and your client is going to give you a mandate to act on their behalf. Basically, it is a power of attorney and it would be a special power of attorney for you to tell you that you have the right to appear on his behalf or her behalf. Okay, that is basically what it is. Um, you do not need to have a written mandate in each and every matter. You do not need so not to have, but to file a written mandate at court in each and every matter. But um, if 
your right to appear on behalf of someone is questioned. Somebody says, um, I don't think this person even have the right to appear on behalf of this party whom he professed to appear for. Then you are required to provide a written mandate in writing to the court and to your opponent. That is if they say they're not sure that you have um, you have the proper authority to appear. It, it can usually happen um, during uh, what I've seen um, where road accident fund matters. You're at court on the day and then the road accident fund says, look, but we, ha we have three or four different sets of attorneys on record for this plaintiff. So who is at court today? And they must give a mandate. And then the client must in writing say that they revoke all previous mandates and they this party now has the mandate. And yeah, when, when it's not clear who the actual representative of the client is, then you have to provide the court with the mandate. Also in the case of a deceased estate, remember, the executive stands in the shoes of the deceased person. If an heir now goes to court and appoints an attorney, which they which the executor is not aware of, that attorney is not cannot appear on behalf of the estate because that attorney doesn't have the proper mandate. So um, when when somebody questions your right to appear on behalf of someone, then within ten days after it has come to the notice of the party, then you must um, give that written yeah a mandate power of attorney. Are there any questions on that? No. It's always good to get the mandate um, from your t from your client in your consultations that you maybe have on the record. But I mean, like I say, it's not a requirement to file with each and every matter a mandate at court. I, I think way back in the past, you used to have to file a written mandate that with proper instructions to um, appear on behalf of a client. Right, now, um, uh, Jessica, can I ask a question? Yes. If you say the power of attorney or the mandate, are you obliged to stick to that one attorney or can you have another attorney? No, no, you, you, uh, um, your attorneys get fired on a daily basis. I mean, a client can choose his or her attorney you know you know that so if the client don't want um you to represent them anymore they can say but i'm going to a new attorney i'm firing you obviously um there's something called an attorney's lien l-i-e-n where you have um, for outstanding funds you, you keep all the files until they pay you or you don't hand it over to the other attorney there's that kind of things but um yeah, a, t a client can f can fire you. A oh, client wow. have the right of the, if t once they've engaged you, they don't have to keep you right on. And clients do that all the time. Oh, so this is not an agreement. Oh no, it's a, just a power of attorney, but it can be revoked at any time. Oh, okay, yeah, so it's not so, binding at all. Yeah, so if 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 they have a, if they have um given you that power, they can revoke it in writing. So they can say, I've now appointed this attorney and I revoke all the previous attorneys that I have appointed. Sometimes clients don't even remember who was the attorneys, especially in road accident, who was the attorneys who did the matter because the matters take so long to come to court that they went to different attorneys and they're not sure. So they just say, I revoke all previous mandates or powers mm -hmm. of attorneys. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, advocate. Okay. Right, so a cause of action. What is a cause of action? Oh, before before I go to the cause of action, a, another thing um, with your with, with the clients. Remember, I told you that um, you must speak about the fees so that the client knows that they can afford you, and you know that that they will be able to pay you for the work that you are doing, and you enter into a fee agreement. Right. Um, another um, um way of getting paid is contingency fees agreement. Um, I don't have a slide on contingency fees agreement, but I can talk to you a little bit about contingency fees agreement. So that is an agreement entered into um, on a, it is a, the no, no win, no pay basis. 
usually attorneys, if they feel that there are good chances of success, that the case have good merits, they will take on a case without um, the client paying them. But then the party and the, 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 sorry, the client and the attorney enters into an agreement and a contingency fee agreement. You know, usually what the contingency fee agreement would say is that um, the attorney, in the case of success, the attorney can claim double his payment or 25% of whatever is um, award is given to the client, um, whichever is the, 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 the smallest or the least. Okay. So um, double your payment, whatever, say your rate is a, a thousand and an hour, so then you can charge two thousand and an hour if you're successful, or twenty five percent depending on whichever is the smallest. So if if you can claim twenty million, you can't we take twenty five percent of twenty million for you? I mean, you can't take that. You can then you take double your double your rate. Okay, if only in the case that you are successful. So the attorney gets that um, because the attorney took the risk and all the expenses the attorney will carry, all the expenses of the litigation, and he can claim all of that back, the disbursements and all of that. He can claim back um, from the from the client um, at the payout. And obviously for his work done, he can get double or 25%, whichever is the least. Is there any questions on the contingency fee agreements? Usually in road accident fund matters, um, attorneys would enter into contingency fee agreements if there's a good case and the, the plaintiff does not have money to pay. Medical negligence is another one. If there's a good case that has made it, you see that it's going to be successful, you take the risk, you um, spend the money as the attorney because you know at the end of the day, if you're going to be successful, you're going to get your money back double. Okay. And the court would want, if there's a contingency fee agreement, you would tell the court if the matter is a contingency fee agreement, the court would want to see that the contingency fee agreement complies with the Contingency Fees Act and that you don't claim more than what, what was agreed on or what you are allowed to claim um, as your fees. Okay. Right. Okay, so we are still in our consultation. We've now discussed the cost and all of that. We've um we know the letter of demand we're going to write, but before we come there, we must find out if our client has a case, right? If there is a cause of action, if there's a reason for us representing the client. Now, what is a cause of action? It's a set of facts that gives rise to a claim recognized by law. Now, um, liability is always based on a legal fact resulting in an obligation. Like with that, for instance, you have that scenario, right? Now, if you look at that, remember I said yesterday, your client comes to you, you let your client tell you his story in his own words and you listen. The first part you listen. And then later on, you are going to put on your lawyer's cap and then you're going to ask the relevant question to fill the gap to see if there is a cause of action. Now, as lawyers, we all know, if we look at that, there's damages to the vehicle and we think what branch of the law is that? This is while our client speaks, we know what branch of the law, it is delete. Okay, so the client might tell us I was parked there and then this guy came and he drove right into me. And whatever the guy will tell it in his own words, but you're going to fill the gap. So you need to ask the relevant questions. Now, if you think back to the law of delict and what you studied um, during the law of delict course, you know that um, a delict has certain elements. It has five elements. So all of those elements has to be met in order for you to be successful in court in proving that there's a delict that has been committed against you. So you must then fill the gaps by asking all of those questions and seeing that, yes, OK, you have a case. That is the cause of action. So in this example, there must have been an act in the sense of a voluntary physical act or the omission on the part of the defendant. Remember, an omission is also an act or um, 
as they would say in your delic books, the conduct, the act, that is the first element. So the act, which is the driving of the vehicle, must have been performed negligently. How did he drive the vehicle? He drove too fast. He drove on the wrong side of the road. He didn't stop at the robot. He didn't check this oncoming vehicles. Whatever the negligence was, you would describe that. So you would ask questions to meet that requirements. Obviously, you wouldn't ask your client, OK, so this is a delete. So did we meet all the requirements? You would ask it with your lawyers, but you would fill the gaps knowing this is what I need in order for me to have my client to have a case. OK, the plaintiff must have suffered damages. OK, so the car is damaged and the negligent act, that is the driving of the vehicle, the negligent driving of the vehicle must have caused those damages, causation. OK, and then harm. The amount of the loss has to be proved. The damages. Okay. Those are those elements. So that is how you would the questions that you would ask to to see that yes, there is a there is a, a actual um delict that was committed here. Um, my client has a case because what if your client tells a look um the car drove um but he didn't touch my vehicle. Um, so when I drove further on, I was thinking about it and I drove into a pole. It's a stupid example, but I'm just making it. You know that there was no negligent, there was no negligent act that caused the damages to the your client's car. So you know there's no delete, there's no cause of action, and that is how you would deal with that. Okay. Um, this for those of you who know, so this is um if a dog bites your client, comes to you, wants to sue the owner of the dog. It's the Actio de Pauperi, if you can remember that from your studies. This is what must be present. The ownership of the animal must be vested in the defendant at the time of the infliction of the injuries, that the animal was a domesticated animal. The animal acted contra naturum sui generis, and the conduct of the animal caused the plaintiff damage. Right? Those are the elements of. of for that claim to meet that claim i'm just going to mention a few more if i still have it so you look at what are the facts of the case you you in your consultation we are still in our consultation what are the facts of the case do these facts constitute a cause of action and which are the essential facts to be proved to constitute the cause of action so this is where we think how we think while a client is telling us the story and how we fill the gaps Right, and then there's um, a few other um, examples of bodily injuries. Um, I'm not going to go through each and every one of it. I just put it up there so that you can read through it. It's not, this is not part of your notes. Contractual claims. What is the remedies and, and what is, yeah, the seller's remedies and then the buyer's remedies. I'm also not going to. Go through that. This is all you you would have all studied this at your um in substantive law. Divorce actions, there must have been a valid marriage. We all know that. Some people come to you and they say they want to claim half of their partner's pension, and then you ask, oh, were you married? And then they say no, they were never married. And you can't you can claim half of the pension benefits in a divorce action if you're married in community of property. So just remember that um, divorce actions, there's several causes of action that are joined in one action. So there's more than one cause of action. In a divorce, there's the divorce. So there must have been a marriage that has irretrievably broken down, right? Um, then there's the custody, the care and the contact of the minor children. That is different. Um, where's, the uh, where's the children going to stay? Maintenance, who is going to pay maintenance? different if there's an estate um married in community of property then it's a joint estate that must be divided or if they are married out of community of property and you must also check if the accrual regime is um applicable yeah and if it's in terms married in terms of the anti-nuptial contract 
any specific performance of any outstanding obligations that is created by the antinuptial contract. You must look at that, look at the antinuptial contract. Um, forfeiture of benefits where, where the people are married in community of property. If the one party says, but I don't want my spouse to get anything out of this marriage, then you must obviously prove substantial misconduct that gave rise to the irretrievable breakdown of the marriage. So just bear all of that in mind. If the client says, this is what I want to know. OK, how, how am I going to help my client best? What do I need? And then you get that information and if the information is there, then you can use it. If it's not there, you can't make it up. Okay, so. Question advocate. Yes. Sorry, man. Is there a, is, is a prescription on claims, for example, on a, let's say an accident or a damage to a car, is there like a prescription or is there a reasonable time that I must bring a claim within? Three years. It's an three ordinary years, debt. Yeah? yeah, ordinary okay, debt yeah. is three years. Okay, thank you. Three years since it happened. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, is there anyone? There's more hands. Can I? Yeah, who's that? Omaya oh, Timms and Spondo. You can go. Those two hands. No, I've, uh, you've answered me, advocate. Oh. Um, yeah, that was okay. me. That was asking. Thank you. And then there's another one. So, to my, I to my, to my uh, yes. I want to find out if you were not married, but you were living together for quite some time. They call you this common law. I don't know what. Are you still entitled to half of the property if you're acquired same together? Um, then you formed a partnership and then um, if you can prove that you've both contributed and then it is the division of the the partnership, the, is the property of the partnership, but you can't, it's not in terms of a divorce. It's it's something totally different. If you've lived together and you've built up property together and you want to, to you want, you, you want to, to, to divide it, yeah, then it's a universal partnership that was entered into. But we don't have in South Africa a common law marriage. Um, no. I think people see it on television and they think, OK, <laughs> if we live together for 10 years or whatever, then we are married. No, we're not. Uh, although, if a lot of leeway. Disease, eh? yeah, a lot of that... leeway, yeah. OK. I, I didn't hear you. What about the deceased? Let's say the... The man, man is deceased now, and now we will we'll never marry to only love together. In, in that case, um, they, they, that is what I wanted to say. There's a lot of leeway that has been made, um, especially also spouses living together. Um, they can get um, on each other's medical aid. Medical aids allow spouses not to be married, but um, to go on as a spouse on a medical aid. And then in, in, in cases of people having lived together and where the one died, People successfully could claim um, some maintenance and some some of that estate, some maintenance out of that estate if they could prove that they were dependent on that person. But I mean, you can't if the person is still alive, you can't claim half of his stuff if you were just okay. living together. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Yes, yes. Dying and, and, and if, if a couple breaks up, but they were never married, then you can't say I'm now entitled to half of his pension and half of his this and half of his that. Do you see what I mean? Unless this was a universal yes, partnership and you want it to be divided, but then you have to prove that it's, this partnership existed and the contributions that was made there too. But it's not a marriage. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Right, okay, so you're still in your in your consultation. You've now um, decided what the cause of action is, so what is the case about? Is there a hand? Yes, advocate. Sorry, man. There's a last one. Yeah. So me, yeah. Yeah. So me again. If let's say on on the claim your car has been hit, right? Let's say hit and run, and you're not able to get the um, the particulars of the defendant. When does prescription run? Does it run from the date of the accident, or from when you are aware as to who is the defendant or who are you going to serve your 
your notice of motion and your particulars of claim on. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um. I don't know. If I, I I I I can't stop myself. I have to correct you now. And nothing to do with the merits of your question. I'll deal with that now. A notice of motion you use in an application, right? And an, a, a summons with the particulars of claim that is an action. Now for damages, you only use the action, so there's no notice of motion. So I just wanted to correct you there. Then you asked, um, you don't know who the perpetrator is against, uh, um, against you, you must claim, but you know, you knew you had the claim and you were looking for this person and you only found the person three years later. Do I understand your question correctly? Yes, advocate. Yes, that's that's my question. You, you, you find this person and you say, oh, you are the one. Yes. I was looking for you, <laughs> and, yes. and then you want to sue. Look, if you can, if you can um, convince the court that you could, you the reason why the matter is not because you weren't aware of the identity of of the perpetrator, you can take your chances. Uh, yeah, you can take your chances if you really didn't know where or whatever. But then also the court will want to know what did you do in three years to f try and find this person, and how did you find the person now? What what was different now to then? Did you actively pursue it? Was there anything that you did to find that person? Are you talking about a specific thing that happened? No, it was it was just a general question. I just oh, had okay. that question. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm oh, fine. Sure. Um, just just to add on that, yes, okay. Oh, sure. oh, yes. Um, I'm I'm actually, I'm actually dealing with a similar matter. So. Um, in my case, the court doesn't care. So the prescription will start running from the date of the accident. And then they place a duty on you as the plaintiff to keep on looking for the defendant yeah. until you find them. You can trace them, appoint tracers, or do whatever means necessary to find the, the defendant. So when the matter prescribes, it prescribes. It was a duty to locate the defendant. Within the three years. Within the three years. And if, and so if after, the three years has come and gone and you were unsuccessful, you lose. That's why I say you can take you a lose, chance and yeah. try and convince the court, but I don't know. It, it depends on, on, on whether you really couldn't find this person and you've done everything to the best. But why can you find this person now and couldn't find him then? So, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Three years is a long time, eh? <laughs> Right, the next, uh, if there's not any questions, I'm moving on the next um, thing that you what have to discuss. Is, what if, uh, uh, this is a hit and run and it happens that you are not able to find this person yeah. up until maybe three years time and stuff. Three years has come and gone and now you find him. Yes. Now you want to sue him and now they say, no, but your case is prescribed. And then you go to court and you say, yeah, but I didn't know where this person was. I only saw him now for the first time. The court is going to want to know what did you do in the three years? Yeah, but if you were actively uh, searching for this person and you could not find him because this is a hit and run <laughs> uh, case, and now you let her maybe find this person, what happens? Are you able to put up uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, position to court, uh, such as to case with the court to accept your line of. Uh, uh, you can uh, try. I don't know if you're going to be successful, but you can always try and persuade the court that you should. The court should see it, see it. You um, indulge you and um, that the claim did not prescribe because you have done your best efforts and this and and they demonstrate to the court what you have done in the three years, and then the court will determine whether you have done enough. You can try okay, your luck, but you. I don't know. Because right, the matter you. has technically prescribed, but I mean, that doesn't mean that the court will find if you can show to the court that the court should not find prescription has actually happened, occurred. All right, ma'am. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Right, so um, the next item for, dis for discussion during your consultation before you are going to institute proceedings is you must ask yourself does my client have legal standing or locus standi 
Legal standing means that the client can institute proceedings or defend proceedings if the client comes to you and says, I want to defend this, right? So um, uh, you, you must ask yourself the question, the first question, does my client have a direct and substantial interest in the proposed litigation? Generally, if the client has an, a direct interest in whatever litigation, then obviously that person have legal standing. It's got to, it's his business. It's, it's his things. It's his, it's, it's about him. He has a direct and substantial interest, right? There are exceptions in terms of section 38 of the constitution. I put it up now, the exceptions, if a constitutional right has been infringed, then um, you don't have to have a direct and substantial interest. You can still go to court, but, but that's an exception. Right? The second question that you also ask is, does my client have the capacity to litigate? So generally people have the capacity to litigate, but there are some people with limited capacities to litigate, and you must be aware of that. Okay, so um, looking at the direct and the substantial interest in the subject matter of the litigation. Right. This is just to demonstrate that. Now, um, these two people um, collided. There was a collision and causes damage. The person in the green car now wants to sue the person in the yellow car. Can the person in the green who drove the green car sue the person in the sorry, not the yellow car, the red car? Sue the person in the red car. Can that person do that? No, only if the person who drove the green car is the owner, because it's only the owner that can suffer damages to the vehicle and not the driver. A driver can cause damages because of his negligent act, but he did not suffer the damages. You understand? So plaintiff who is the owner of vehicle A <clears throat> can claim damages from the defendant who is the driver of vehicle B, irrespective of whether the driver is the owner of vehicle B. and. The defendant, who is the owner of vehicle B, can have a counterclaim against the driver of the other vehicle. Okay, is that clear? Yes, there's a hand. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to ask. Uh, let's say uh, the owner of the car uh, is the bank. Then who would have local standing to act in such a case? The owner of the car? Is the bank? Maybe you're still paying for the car via installments. Oh, um, yeah. But if you, but is aren't you the owner because you are responsible for licenses and you are responsible to insure the car? So aren't you the owner? You have a credit agreement with the bank, but but aren't you the owner of the vehicle? You only the bank is not the owner of the vehicle, are they? Yes, I wanted to ask the now. Who the vehicle is have... not registered in the bank's name. The vehicle is registered in your name. So I will still have uh, the rights to, to sue? Yes, because you suffered the damages. Because remember, the bank will want their money from you whether the vehicle exists or not. So you, still I... owe the, you will still owe the bank money. So then uh, I wouldn't need to establish local standing in such a case. No, because you would be the, you would be the one that would be responsible for the damages. So I, I mean that would be suffering the damages. So ultimately, you would have to fix it. The bank is not the one that's going to fix it. If you have insurance, your insurance can then act on your behalf and claim it because your insurance is going to fix it because you've insured the vehicle against such eventualities so that the insurance will take over in your stead and stand in your place and then sue sue the negligent driver, but not the bank. The the bank, um, if the bank requires you to insure the vehicle for such eventualities, if, if you still pay a, a vehicle off, the bank would require that you insure the vehicle so that they know it is protected and the and the bank will have um they keep the papers of the car um but the car is registered at the authorities in your name. Until you have finished paid it, the bank will give it to you. So the bank can, as part of the debt that you owe them, take the vehicle and sell the vehicle. But that doesn't mean that the debt will be extinguished. If your debt is higher than what the vehicle is sold for, you still owe the bank the balance. 
but the vehicle is yours and the, the, the yeah it is just like a security for the bank that they will get some of their money okay thank you right um you must have a direct it's not too uh, far yes yes yeah my, my end is up sure sure i see okay I, I just want to ask um, now that you are saying that is the owner that can sue the, the other party so yeah. i just want to ask in this scenario where uh, let's assume the owner just recently passed away and um, and the um, vehicle um which belonged to the deceased um this deceased maybe he did not have the will, and at that point where uh, the vehicle got involved in an accident, um, maybe the the family had not allocated the vehicle to a specific individual uh, as a, as a as an owner or responsible for that vehicle. Uh, so how how do we deal with that scenario where the the owner was paying the bank or, you know, the owner to whom the car is registered has, has, has passed away, but it had not yet been allocated to another human being. Well, if it hasn't been allocated to another, as soon as an executor is appointed by the master of the high court, which must be appointed if the person has property and has, has deceased, <coughs> the, that executor takes the place of the owner. Yes, are you there? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah. Yes, oh. I can hear you. Yes, the executor will take the place of the owner. So it's not up to the family to 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 appoint somebody to take care of the vehicle and to have that is all the ex the executor um of the estate will do that. All right, no, thanks. Noted. Okay. Okay. Right, so you must have a direct interest. It must not be a too far removed actual interest. It must not be an abstract interest, an academic interest or a hypothetical interest. And the interest is in the right, which is the subject matter of the litigation and to the outcome of the litigation. Indirect financial interest is insufficient. For example, if you hold shares in a company, it does not entitle you to litigate on behalf of the company. If you have shares in Standard Bank and I don't pay my bond with Standard Bank, you can't come and sue me because I'm not paying Standard Bank just because you are a shareholder. You see, that is too far removed. Okay, so you must have a direct and substantial interest in the litigation. Um, the exceptions in 38, section 38 of the Constitution that I referred you to. Um, um, peep, anyone acting in their own interest or on behalf of another person who cannot act in their own name or as a member of or in the interest of a group or class of persons, class action suits, or in the public interest or an association acting in the interest of its members. So in this case, this is, the, this is the exception to having a direct and substantial interest. So you can, if a right in the Bill of Rights has been um, infringed on, the locus standard is extended. So you can actually, on behalf of another person, institute an action if that person cannot act in their own name or as a member of the group or if the litigation is in public interest. Okay, that is the exceptions. Right. I'm asking yourself the second question. Does my, my does my client have the capacity to litigate? A minor under the age of seven does not have the capacity to litigate solely in capux. He must be represented by a parent or a guardian. He or she must be represented by a parent or a guardian. That means the parent or the guardian is the plaintiff. So if a minor is injured, the, the, you can't institute proceedings in the minor's name if the minor is under seven. If the minor is seven years and older, you can either be represented by the by the parent or guardian, so it can be in the name of the parent or the guardian, or the older than seven, 
the minor can be the plaintiff, but then the minor would be assisted by the parent or the guardian. So not on, the, on their own. Okay, so if somebody comes to you and wants to sue on behalf of a child, just remember that. And, and um, you're going to cite, when you cite the parties, that is when you describe the parties, usually it would be in the first paragraph where you just cite the plaintiff. If a minor is under the age of seven, that is now when the father or the guardian, sorry, the parent or the guardian is the plaintiff. That is how you would do it. The plaintiff is Clive Ingalls an adult male plumber who resides at 112 North Road, Cape Town, and who is cited in his representative capacity as father and natural guardian of Rachel Ingalls, a minor female scholar who resides with the father at 112 North Road, Cape Town. So you can see the plaintiff is the father when the child is under seven because the child cannot act at all. When the child is over seven, it can be as, as I've described now, or you have the choo you can choose whether the child is the guardian and then the child must be assisted by the parent or the guardian. So in that case, it would be the plaintiff is Rachel Ingalls, a minor female scholar who resides at 112 North Road, Cape Town, and who is duly assisted herein by her father and natural guardian, Clive Ingalls, an adult male plumber who resides at 112. North Road, Cape Town. Right. Um, sometimes parents um, act on their own behalf and on behalf of a child. For example, if a child was maybe injured in a motor vehicle accident or injured in any way and the father had medical expenses as a result of the injuries. Oh, I'm, I'm saying father, but I actually mean parent or the parent had medical expenses. So to claim for that medical expenses, he can claim in the same proceedings for that medical expenses and whatever other damages the minor has suffered. So there's a dual capacity that we say where the guardian acts on his own behalf for medical expenses or child negligent, negligently injured in an accident and in a representative capacity for pain and suffering, loss of amenities, etc. And in that case, you would state it like this. The plaintiff is Clive Engel, an adult male plumber who resides at 112 North Road, Cape Town, and is sues here in, in his personal capacity as well as in his representative capacity as father and natural guardian of Rachel Ingalls, a minor female scholar who resides with the father at 112 North Road, Cape Town. Now, the cost is you with both assistance, that is when the child is older than seven and you've chosen to use that option, and representation. The minor is still the litigant and is liable for the costs. Unless the Guardian Institute action recklessly, he is not liable for any costs. Now, we all know that if a minor is a plaintiff and the court gives a cost order, where is the minor going to get money to pay the costs? Um, remember, I told you yesterday when we were doing officers of the court, the taxing master, I said, the general rule is that the successful litigant is entitled to his or her costs. So if the minor is unsuccessful, the, the obviously that would now be the person who would be responsible for the costs. And if it's a minor, unless it is um, not reckless, the minor would be responsible and you would not get your cost then. Okay. <laughs> Ma'am, yes. what happens if the minor is married? This is now a minor who would, who would have become um, major by, by marriage. Isn't it when you get married, then you become a major automatically? Okay, noted. Yeah, because a minor um, uh, in South Africa is uh, someone under the age of 18. So if you get married, um, First of all, if you if you if you want to get married under the age of 18, you need the consent of your parent or guardian, or you can apply to court for consent to get married. In that case, um you you have local standard to apply to court to um yeah. But otherwise you you would need the consent of your parent to get married if you're younger than 18. And um if the minor is under 18, you what you actually are saying is that the minor would be able to pay the cost. Is that what you're getting at? 
Uh, yes, because they would then obviously have locust handy in their, you know, in, in their in their own right. Well, they don't have until they are 18 years old. But if they are married, yes, they have locust in the, Yes, in their that's own what right. I was yes. getting to. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they would. OK, sure. they would, because I think the marriage just changed, changes that. So a minor may litigate without assistance when applying for a curator at Lightem to be appointed. Now, sometimes when a person don't have a parent or a guardian, a guardian was appointed or a parent is absent in the child's life, but there's a claim that has to be instituted on behalf of the child, then you can apply for the appointment of a curator at Lightem. That is a curator who stands, uh, who assists and stands in for the minor during litigation. Now, in, a, in the application to have that curator appointed, the minor um, can act without legal assistance. Also, where the court grants permission um, for the minor to act without assistance if the minor have applied to court to be emancipated. Or when um, applying for permission to marry without the guardian's consent, the minor may may act without the permission and when a statute permits a minor to act without the permission of a parent or guardian. OK, so you need to know this if you are consulting. This is that is why we are doing this. Remember, we are still in our consultation and we now need to find these things out. Right. Married women now, uh, married women. Or not married women, I don't know, I must take that off, but the marital power was abolished in 1993. So if married women have full locus stand I, but um, spouses married in community of property have to have each other's consent, written consent in order to litigate. So if you're married in community of property in terms of section 17, one of the matrimonial property act, men and women who are married in community of property require the written consent from the spouse in order to litigate. There are exceptions. Yes, there's a hand. Is it an old end? OK. There are exceptions when you do not need your, if you're married in community of property and when you don't need your spouse's permission. The exceptions are um, when you are acting in the cause and scope of your trade and profession and you're litigating in the cause and scope of your profession or your trade, then you obviously don't need your spouse's permission or consent in writing. When it's property that you keep separately um, from the joint estate, you don't need your spouse's permission. If it is a claim for bodily injuries, you don't need your spouse's consent and litigation against your spouse, you don't need their consent. Okay, litigation that you institute against your spouse, like divorce, you don't need their consent. Makes sense. So there are exceptions, but parties married in community of property do need each other's written consent. So if a person comes to you and um, they want to institute proceedings so you, and they are married in community of property, remember you need to get the written consent of their spouse. Right. Um, people declared of um, incapable of handling their own affairs. Yes, is, are there, is there a hand? There is a hand up, but I think that hand is not up for me. I'm sorry, it doesn't want to go down. I don't know what's going oh, on. Oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. OK. <laughs> yes. Um, are we going to do this when we do um, specific applications? But um, if a person is incapable of handling his or her own affairs because um, the person may have a brain injury sustained anyway, um, or the person may be diagnosed with um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease or one of those and can't um, handle their own affairs. No, I passed my call. Yes. Uh, Matusha. What? Matusha. You can hear somebody. You Eat yourself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, colleagues, we have not given you consent to make noise when we're in class, so please uh, mute your mics. Yeah, I, I'm trying to mute that person. Yeah, I've done it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um. So, 
Yeah, remember, um, this is an application that you have to bring to court, and it's not an easy application because this makes inroads into a person's ability to act on their own behalf. So it's it is quite a, a, a huge thing. Um, because all your properties then are being controlled by somebody else if you are incapable of handling your own affairs. So I don't know how you are going to know when a client comes to you that they are not by the full and sober senses. Um, but just take heed and try to check if this person is full and sober senses. You probably would hear if they don't talk um, sense, but we can also be full day. Yeah. Hey, please mute, please mute. It's muted. It's muted. Also watch out for the following. Um, the following people. Groups of people. Prodigals. Right, you know what a prodigal is? A prodigal is the person. Who's not able to handle her own finances? Use her own finances. It's got a very neat charging solution. Okay, we can hear that. Yeah, a person who is not able to handle his or her own finances. Yes, yes, that is that is a that is a prodigal, and you you have to bring an application to court to have a person to be declared a prodigal. If you are worried about maybe a family member who's um spending their money and not um and need assistance, you can actually apply and have a person be declared a prodigal. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to see in your notes what they say about it, but I don't seem to. Yeah, they, they don't have all of that anymore. They used to have it in your notes. Okay, just remember you have to look out for that. I don't know how you're going to, to find out if the person is a prodigal, but you have to look out for that. Then insolvent, remember insolvent, um, there would be a trustee that's appointed. Insolvents can't institute um, proceedings without the trustee, but they can defend. So you have to also take note, special attention to that. If a person comes to you and is a fugitive from justice, he cannot institute proceedings, but he can defend. So if you you have to defend okay. him. Advocate. I'm I'm looking for that page and I, uh, I'm about with Locust Pandai. Please, please mute this person who is making noise, advocate. Who's making the noise? Let me see. Okay, there's no no one that I see now. Maybe the person has muted himself. The um fugitive from justice, that is the person who um who who the police are looking for is running away. You can't um appear for him. In a civil matter, you can't institute proceedings for that person. Okay, so if you find um, Mr. Bester that is on the run, you can't have him. I don't know if you heard the story, the crazy story about this person, Mr. Bester. Alien enemies. An alien enemy is a person who is a citizen of a country with which we are at war. So there's none of that at the moment, but. Um, Remember, you must take note of that. Diplomats. Can you sue a diplomat? We all remember the matter of Grace Mugabe when she came here to South Africa. Um, if, a, if a diplomat is on diplo diplomatic duty, then he, he or she um, enjoys a diplomatic immunity. Now, if a diplomat does something to your client and your client wants to sue them, remember there might be diplomatic immunity. So you have to first check whether that diplomat enjoys diplomatic immunity. Um, and, and, and if the person 
enjoys diplomatic immunity, you must then find out if they will waive that immunity or if they won't waive it, the embassy or the consulate, if they don't waive it, then they can't sue him or her. Okay, so just remember that judges, if you're going to sue a judge, you have to first get the permission of the judge president in the division where that judge is sitting. So you write to the judge president and you tell the judge president you have a claim against this judge and you want to institute proceedings. Can he grant you the necessary permission? If you want to sue members of parliament while parliament is in session, remember parliament is in Cape Town, then you have to sue out of the Western Cape High Court. Partnerships, firms and association, if you want to sue them, Remember, if you sue a partnership, you just don't sue one partnership, but every member of the partnership. So the special need that you have to take of all of those requirements. You are still in your consultation and we're trying to establish whether your client has locus standard. And that is now the end of the locus standard. Do I have any questions? Uh, yes. Yes, can you ask? Yeah, I, yes, it's Kaifas. I, I just want you to... Uh, clarify on diplomats. Uh, so if I can't sue diplomats uh, or a diplomat, um, maybe let's say I collide with a vehicle of a diplomat and my car gets badly damaged. How do I find records uh, in that situation? Yeah, that is a tough question, eh? Because if, if the diplomatic immunity is not waived and that person enjoys diplomatic immunity, then you don't have recourse. It would be, I'm sorry to say, but it would be as if lightning struck you. Who do you sue? Yeah, it's just like that. You don't have recourse. Can Look, um, yeah. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, you may. A police um, is judge is a judge, not a human being. A judge. What? Yes. Why can't he or she be sued? You can be sued, but before you sue him, you must get permission from the judge president in the division mm -hmm. where that judge is sitting. So you must first write, and that judge president must give you permission to sue him. Why must he be so? Please pardon my question. <laughs> <laughs> Why must it be so? <laughs> yes. Is, is that, are they I immune? <laughs> because they have important functions. Well, they are the considered. Court. Yes, sir. You, you can, just what, what did you say now? <laughs> that They have important functions. They have duties to carry on in court. So they can be so being distracted from their functions. Yeah. They, they, is that, does, does that answer your question, sir? Yes, I think it's, a, it's an aspect of the answer I want. Thanks. Yeah, remember judges remain judges for the rest of their life. Once you appointed a judge, you, you will remain a judge and you will receive your salary until you die, even after you retire, unless you are impeached. Sorry, can I ask some? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, well, I... Yeah. You indicated... Well, you, you say you, you can sue members of parliament. No, I didn't I say that. you can't. I said you can. When they're in session, you must sue out of the Western Cape High Court. That is what you must remember. Yeah. You can okay. sue okay. them. You, you can sue them, but if yes. they raise a matter within, in Parliament, uh, you will not be able because they are, uh, no, they are protected. No, you can't. It no. may not be in everything. Yes. But no, then, no, I don't mean that kind of sue. I don't mean that you're going to sue somebody for because they, they are protected in Parliament to certain things. They yes. can say certain but things that they wouldn't be allowed off, outside. Yeah. Yes. But outside Parliament, you can sue them. Yes, yes. Yes. But then okay. if, then if Parliament want, is in session, to, you would sue them here in the Western Cape. Yeah. Okay. I want to I want to come to the issue of, of judges. If a judge, if I sue a judge on a personal capacity, mm -hmm. can I sue the judge? Or in any capacity, you can sue the judge? No, you can, but before you sue him, you must um, ask permission from the judge president, and he must explain to the judge president why you want to sue him, and the judge president will give you that permission. 
in actual fact, I wanted to know uh, if I have to, not to, to sue, but if I have to always uh, seek permission from the judge president, even if it's a personal, it's in his personal capacity. If you want to sue the judge president, then obviously you have to go higher than him. You'll have to go no, to I'm a judge saying, president. I'm yes. I'm saying advocate. Um, if I have to sue a judge in his own personal capacity, so does it mean uh -huh. that I have to uh, get permission all the time from uh, the judge president? Yes. Personal, in ca personal yes. capacity or judicial capacity? Okay. Yes. No, thanks. Personal capacity, you don't sue judges for appeals and that. That's not suing the judge. But in his personal capacity, if the judge owes you money or if the judge drove into you or whatever the judge did, or if he defamed you outside of court, he said something about you like a normal human being. Before you sue him, you get permission from the judge president. What if he didn't yeah, know like he was that. a judge? Hey? What if he didn't know he was a judge? How would you not know he was a judge? Yes, if you're going to sue him, because you're going to say what work he does. So how, I mean, how are you going to get away with saying, I didn't know it was a judge? I, I, I think we, we, we all can look up what people are, who are judges. I don't know if, if you don't know okay. he's a judge and you didn't get the permission, I think you must get the permission afterwards. Then the judge can raise that as a special plea and say you didn't meet the requirements of getting the permission and now you must first get the permission. Can I use an example, advocate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's say there was an incident of a judge that was found drunk. Let's say a judge hits your car. You don't know the person is a judge. You think maybe it's just a senior mm. citizen of some sort. Ne? And then you institute your proceedings. And then can you then raise that plea to say, no, you didn't, you didn't request permission from, um, from the relevant, uh, from the judge president in order to sue him? I, I don't know whether you get the example. I, I hear what you're saying. You don't know the work that the person does. Yeah, I don't. Um, he can then raise that you didn't get the required permission, and then everything must be stayed until you do get the permission. If you do get the permission, that that would be the effect of that. He Hello. can raise a special plea. Evening, advocate. Good evening. Uh, if the can the judge president refuse to give permission? Yes, yes, he can. In that circumstance if he refuses isn't he playing a part of a a judge already because he you have a the right to litigate yeah i, I isn't suppose you infringing on your right to litigate if he denies you that permission yes, he, is. he would be a eh? he would be but i mean um, he would have a have to have a very good reason to refuse your permission okay. yeah I, yeah. I think so as well, because otherwise, if the reason does not make sense, I'm sure instance, you can take it further. Check it up, yeah. For instance, most political uh, uh, office holders uh, do have immunity, same as judges. The reason being that some of these uh, officials do have uh, important functions to, uh, you know, to to fulfill. So they can be, uh, you know, constantly be uh, distracted by court cases and all that. So as a result, that is what brings about this immunity. You know. No, but but, so, but members of parliament and judges don't have immunity. It's just that you have to meet a certain step and that the JP must know, look here, this judge, there's this complaint about it and he is going to be sued. And if there's probably merit, he won't refuse. But yeah. Look, um, I only know of one incident, um, personally that I know of where a judge where permission was granted because it was published. Um, it was way back. Um, it was um, somebody was suing Judge Slope, not the Slope, Judge Desai. And they got and permission from, from Slope. And Matanta as well. Was he sued? No, he was, he was, is that the drunk driver? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, imagine uh, the judge president said, no, you can't take this case further. Just think of the outcry. Judges are allowed to drunk drive. So they must be very careful in how they make the decision to not allow. Yeah.
Okay, so there are more hands. I don't know if it's old hands. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Tell me which section of the constitution, or is there a section in the constitution that requires you to get permission to, to adjust? That you have to make an application? I don't know if it's in the constitution. I don't think it's in the constitution. Um, I, I, I speak under correction. I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to your question. Because in the start of the lecture, we said everybody is equal in the eyes of the law. Yes. So that, is, that is why I'm asking. So I, I, it's not that you can't sue a judge. It's just that before you sue him, you must get the permission. Yes. Remember, it's, a, it's not that you can't sue a judge. You can sue a judge. You just need the permission. Okay, secondly, in terms of the diplomats, I think you can sue the embassy because the, the can diplomat, you sue the embassy? Embassy, where the diplomat is uh, employed by. In a civil matter, for yeah, damages. So for damages. And what do you do in a criminal matter? I'm uh, well. I think the criminal matter you have. You, you can't uh, uh, do much because he's got um, what you call it immunity. Yeah, he's also got immunity in civil matters. Um, and I think if they don't want to waive it, you say you can sue the embassy. Um, um, the very reason for diplomatic immunity, it's got to do with the sovereignty of states. Now, remember the, the premises where that um, embassy is, is deemed to be part of that country. So it would be if you sue them, it would be kind of like an act of war or something like that, or or or, or um, foreign affairs relationships, and you would be going on th that in in that way, which is not advised, and that is why there's the immunity. The whole reason behind diplomatic immunity, when people of another country is in your country, is to keep the relationships between the countries. Is there, there's the whole background of that? So you wouldn't um. Yeah, if remember the people that is there in the embassy, they are deemed to be in that country, okay. even though they are on your soil. And if you now going to <clears throat> sue the embassy, you're actually suing the other country. So, so what happens in a case of the example of the bank, where your car is owned by the bank, right? And uh, for example, you have you are deceased, right? You have no, you have no uh, uh, property. You have no estate, and 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 the bank is owed money, right? And the cause of the accident was this diplomat or ambassador. So the bank has no recourse in claiming any amount, any money from the embassy or the diplomat. What local standard does the bank have in the first instance? Where does the bank get legal standing? Because the bank is not the owner of the vehicle. Yes, the bank can take the vehicle. The bank have some security over the vehicle for some of the money. But once they have sold it, the rest they must claim from the estate. And if there's nothing in the estate, then it's a loss for the bank. Okay, noted. Thank you. Okay. Yes, there's a couple of more hands. Yugen. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you just answered. There's a suggestion of a break. Um, it's seven o'clock. Um, is this an is this an opportune time to take a yes? Let's take a break for fifteen minutes and then come back and then we go on again. But is there any question before we take the break? No. Yes. No. Ah, uh, no, ma'am. It was just an add-on on suing of judges that yes. there's been a recent judgment in the high court about a certain judge before he became a judge about rough money that was not paid over to the client. I saw that, so, yeah. Which is, so for people who say that uh, judges can be sued, I think we just, uh, the notice is just procedural. Yeah, because a, a, a judge like, president who says, no, you can't sue, I mean, he will have to explain himself. Why, why do you think this person is above the law? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think um, maybe just to, if it's a nonsense claim, or maybe, I don't know, for I the embarrassment of the judiciary, uh, just to keep it out of court, maybe tell the judge, look, sort this out or whatever. I don't know what is the, the reason for that, but you need the JP's permission. Yeah. 
the sewer jets. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello? Yes, I hear you. Yes, if I cannot be able to sue the diplomats because they are protected, then uh, why they can't why can my is why can my then state jump in and and pay me the damages your state the people is from the other state but i mean would you would your state want to now do that for you because now you're going on different territories you're going uh yeah you will you want to fight with the other state because of one citizen it's much bigger than that Look, I only speak from from what I know and how I perceive you can go and read it up, but that is what I've read about diplomatic. It's part of the sovereignty of states. You don't just sue another state while they are in your country. Usually, that's the, obviously they will deal with, with that diplomat who, who is causing problems for them. But if that diplomat enjoys immunity, he or she enjoys immunity. That's the same that happened to Grace Mugabe when she was here and she hit the woman with an electric cord. They couldn't arrest her because the country said she was on um, she was on official business and she enjoys diplomatic immunity, so they couldn't touch her. Mm. Okay. okay, no thanks. Mm. Okay, let's take the break. Uh, there's another hand. I don't know if that is an old hand. Uh, Ma'am, I want to find out something here. Hello? Yes, I'm here. I yes. I just want to find out. I'm reading the definition of diplomats here. It says it cannot be prosecuted or otherwise forced to appear in criminal court, nor can they be sued in civil courts except for their personal or non-official involvement in certain commercial. Yeah, non-official. Yeah, so I just want to find out how will you I, uh, uh, determine that that person was not in a... Um, in a official, official capacity. capacity you, yes. you you will find that out from the from the embassy. Look, there's a list of diplom all the diplomats who enjoys immunity. There's a list published on the website of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and you can also um ask the embassy whether this person was in fact on official duty at the time, and you can determine the if the because if the person was on official duty they do enjoy immunity and then you can ask that they waive it and if they don't want to waive the diplomatic immunity then you don't have recourse yeah All right. okay right can we take the break now or is there anyone else let's please, take the break take for 15 break. minutes it is now Eight minutes past. Okay. Maybe we can come back at twenty, at 20 past. Mr. Prince, are you exercising your diplomatic immunity to unmute the mic?
Um... Okay, hope everybody is back. So I will proceed. Um, right, and um, we are still. Okay, let me just unmute um, certain people. It seems to be a disturbance. OK, it's gone away. Right. Um, the next um, aspect that you have to deal with during your consultation is to decide which court has jurisdiction. Right? Now, what is jurisdiction? It is the competence which a court has to hear and determine an issue between the parties. I'm trying to see who is that that is making that noise, but I can't see. Can everybody just mute their microphones if you can hear me? Right, so the competence which a court has to hear and determine an issue between the parties before it, that is jurisdiction, right? The first issue is which general type of court can hear the matter. Example, the high court, the magistrate's court, the labor court, the income tax court, or other specialist courts, which we have. We have the land claims court. We have the, what, what other courts do we have? We have the competition tribunal. Yeah, income tax, I've got the. Um, yeah, I can't think of more quotes. Now it will come back to me. Anyway, so you must decide out of which court you must institute the proceedings, right? Um, and then you must look geographically speaking out of which court. It's not geographically, is where is the court situated, right? Um, Sorry, I've the same thing, right? So in terms of Section 21 of the Superior Courts Act, um, the court may generally have jurisdiction over persons living inside of its area of jurisdiction. The court will have jurisdiction. And if the cause of action um, arose in that area of jurisdiction and then in relation to all matters of which the court can take cognizance of, if you read um, Section 21 of the Superior Courts Act, you will see that. Um, you, you, do you all have the Superior Courts Act? You have access to it on, 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 on safely, they would be, right? Right, so the grounds for jurisdiction, and I'm taking you back to your studies 
at university. The reasons for jurisdiction, why the court would have jurisdiction, the ratione domicili, the reason of domicile, ratione rei gestai, and ratione rei citai. Right, rei gestai is where the cause of action arose, and rei citai is where property is situated. Right, so domicili affords jurisdiction to um, the area where the defendant usually resides or is domiciled. You can, like I say, you must follow the defendant where he is. So you would issue it out of that court where the defendant is. Regista is where the cause of action arose. And if it is based on a delict, it is where the delict actually was committed. If it is based on contract, it can be any of the three reasons. Um, in It's where the contract was entered into, where it was performed, even if it was only partly performed in a certain area, or where it was breached. In all of those, courts would have jurisdiction. Right? And a race tie relates to property, immovable property, um, where the property is situated. Um, and also with regards to movable property, it can be any of those three reasons, where the property is, where the cause of action arose, or where the defendant is domiciled. Right, and then um, if a claim is for money, if the defendant is an Inkala of South Africa, then you can use the reason of domicile or um, Rejestai where the a cause of action arose, right? Inkala means a citizen of South Africa. If the defendant is a peregrinus of South Africa, that means the defendant is not a citizen in the court, um, doesn't have jurisdiction. Unless either the defendant or his goods has been, no, not the defendant, the defendant's goods has been attached. Remember in the past they used to be able to arrest you to confirm jurisdiction. That has been declared unconstitutional. Now they can um, attach your property, but with caution, the court wouldn't easily al allow to attach property to confirm jurisdiction. If you are a citizen of South Africa, the court won't allow that to confirm jurisdiction. If you are not a citizen, only with caution would the court allow. Um, but the court will also have jurisdiction if the case is tied to South Africa and the defendant was on South African soil when the summons was served. Then the court will have jurisdiction over that person. That is if the person is at Peregrinus of South Africa. Right, in marital um, matters, divorce, um, you remember from your studies of family law, the plaintiff or the defendant must have been domiciled for a year in the area of jurisdiction of the court prior to the institution of the divorce. Okay. Not less than a year. They must have lived in the area in that court will have jurisdiction. Right. Are there any questions on jurisdiction? So you must now decide out of which court you're going to issue. Now, remember, I told you about the high court and the magistrate's court and um the inherent jurisdiction that the High Court has. That means the High Court um, can give any relief um, of which it can take cognizance of. And the court can only give relief that um, that it can give effect to. So if, um, if a court, if you approach the court and the relief you request is going to be nothing, but just on the paper that you're successful and you're not going to give effect to that, then the court won't give Give you that relief because the court only has jurisdiction if it can make that difference. Okay. Um, if you are going to, uh, I can ask you a question. You can. Who's this? Yes, sorry, man. Yeah, it's Loazi. I just want to ask any because as you mentioned that it's now illegal. The constitutional court declared illegal to arrest. Declare, yeah, property. To no, to, to arrest the person, not not to 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 attach property. You can still, but with caution. But to arrest the person to confirm jurisdiction, that is illegal. Oh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Of course, my question was on 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 a person who's visiting South Africa, like a foreigner. Mm -hmm. Um, he has no property. Yeah. No, yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Maybe just coming in for the visit for the weekend. Well, if, if if you're going to sue him and and you and he's an, he's in South Africa when he receives the papers from the sheriff, then the court will have jurisdiction to hear the matter. 
Yeah, I'm saying like, let's say the person then leaves because then you want to attach the property before they leave, which would basically in this case would be the car. That would be- If he has a car, only, okay. Yeah, maybe that's the only thing is- Then you have to bring an application. Board. But, uh, but but the court uh, the court will, can can give can attach property to confirm jurisdiction if it is necessary. But if the person says, "Look, I agree to the court's jurisdiction and I will defend the matter and whatever," then obviously not. But the court can give you that um, that the property be attached to confirm jurisdiction. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's in terms of section twenty eight of the. Superior Courts Act. Ooh. So if, if if you can attach, you can, but if it is not possible, then the person must have been in South African soil when it's been served with the papers. Any other questions? None. Right. Okay, now... You are still busy in your consultation. Remember, we're still at the pre-litigation stage. We have now ascertained that there's a case, the cause of action. We've ascertained that our client have legal standing. Or if there's certain requirements that has to be meet, met before legal standing can be established, we do that. We know that what we must look for. We know now jurisdiction, what we must look out for and, and what courts will have jurisdiction out of which courts must we issue. And the next thing we must decide is whether what procedure are we going to use? Now, this is important. You can either use the action procedure and the action procedure starts with a summons. And it ends in a trial, right? So unless the matter is settled or withdrawn, it ends with a trial. A trial is when you are going to call witnesses who's going to give oral evidence in court. Under oath, they're going to give oral evidence. That is the action procedure, right? The application procedure, which is the other procedure, starts with the notice of motion and affidavits and is decided on the papers. So in the application procedure, you don't call witnesses to give oral evidence. Remember in the beginning I said you only place evidence before the court. It's, that is our duty as legal practitioners. We have to place the evidence before the judge so that the judge can decide which evidence is going to accept and which is going to reject, and then he must motivate why he does that. Now, the evidence in an application is in the affidavit. Remember, an affidavit is a statement that is sworn to under oath. So that is also evidence. So if the affidavit is not a commission by a commission of oaths, then it is not evidence and then the judge cannot consider it. So application procedure starts with a notice of motion and affidavits and is decided on the papers. Now, interchangeably, they use motion proceedings and application proceedings. That is the same thing because application starts with a notice of motion and an affidavit in support of the relief that is set out in the notice of motion. Action procedure is where we deal with summonses, right? And we call the parties different. In an action, we call the parties plaintiff and defendant. In an application, we call the parties applicant and a respondent. Okay, so just remember that if you are going to draft in the exam, don't confuse the parties. I've seen many people, they start and they talk about the plaintiff and then later on in the pleadings, they talk about applicants and respondents and they are all confused with the parties. Just remember, if you're doing an action procedure, if it's an it was a summons and the particulars of claim, plaintiff and defendant. You don't talk about applicants and respondents and the other way. Right, so the differences, this is in your notes, um, this table. First of all, what the parties are called. And in an action procedure where the parties are called plaintiff and defendant, you deal with substantial factual disputes, right? In an application, because it is decided on the papers, the factual dispute is not such substantial that you have to now call witnesses because you can decide it on the papers before the court, right? An action commences with the issuing of a summons by the plaintiff and an application commences with an issuing of a notice of motion and the supporting founding affidavit. Now, remember I told you what issuing is, that is where you go and issue the matter by the registrar, where they open a court file and they give it the case number and they put the case number on your process and it 
the, uh, it's commensurate with the case number on the file and every subsequent document that you're going to file is going to go in that court file that is issuing and they date stamp it. So application commences with the issuing of a notice of motion. A notice of motion always have the, a supporting affidavit because you need the evidence. You're not going to in a notice of motion need oral evidence, so the evidence must be there. In an action, it is summons and the particulars of claim if it is a combined summons that has been used. If it's a simple summons, it's just a summons. We'll do the different kinds of summonses when we get there. Right. In an action after the summons has been issued, there are further pleadings that are exchanged. So the defendant will file a pleading called the plea. And the defendant, if he has a counterclaim at that stage, would also file a counterclaim. Right. And then um, after that, the plaintiff can reply to the defendant's plea. And if there was a counterclaim, then the plaintiff must plead to the counterclaim. Right. And then after that, you, you get further pleadings, which I will also talk to you a bit later on about. Um, you get further pleadings in action procedures. Now, in an application, you start it out with a notice of motion and the affidavit. Now, that first affidavit is referred to as the founding affidavit. The application is founded on that affidavit, right? And then the respondent will file an answering affidavit, also referred to sometimes as an opposing affidavit. It's the same thing. Answering affidavit and opposing affidavit. Right? That's the same thing. And then the applicant can file a replying affidavit. And at that, once the replying affidavits are, are, are filed, then that is the end of the, of the exchange of pleadings in the application procedure. In the action procedure, we have further pleadings. And at, after the pleadings have closed, we come to the stage where we do the practical arrangements for the case. That is the preparation for trial. OK, then certain preparatory steps are taken. For example, discovery, pre-trial conferences, um, judicial case management, um, exchange of expert evidence. All of that happens. The practical arrangements that happens in actions where you're going to have a trial and call witnesses. Right? In applications, we've already exchanged all the information, all the evidence, and that has been in. There is no preparation for trial. The motion procedure ends in the motion court. Um, no oral evidence is presented. The case is argued on the papers before the court. Right. So once you have done the practical arrangements in the action procedure, then and that is done, then you get to the trial where you're going to call your witnesses and you're going to lead oral evidence. Your witness is going to be subjected to being cross-examined by your opponent. And after that, you would argue the matter based on what evidence was led. OK, so you can see that the action procedure is actually longer than the application procedure. Are there any questions? There's a hand up. Uh, hmm? is there, yes, the entire how do you... Oh, there's two people speaking. OK, so one at a time. Oh, Maya. That's the one how I can see. You... How do you know when to institute an application or a action plan action procedure? Okay. Yes, we're going to get there as to when you when you do the one or the other. We, I'm going to I'm going to tell you. So yeah. My question is: there yes. time limits uh, for action proceedings whereby uh, it, uh, it's in the trial preparation for trial stage? Like, is there a time limit? to when everything should go to court and all those things, or there's no time limit. It can even be for two years. In the high court, you usually wait two years, sometimes longer, to get a court date. So um, oh, I'm, 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 I'm a bit confused. You, when you ask, is there a time limit? Um, once the, the summons has been issued in the action procedure, once the summons has been issued, now the case is now pending in the court. And you now do what you have to do in terms of the court rules in order to get your matter before the court. So um, when you ask about time limits, just just be more specific. What is it exactly that you're asking? Like, let's say uh, 
now you, you ask me to discover and then I don't discover. Uh, do I have a time limit to discover or? Yes, you do. The do. rule says, the rule says if you are called upon to discover, that means if your opponent gives you a notice to discover, you must within 20 days file a discovery affidavit. If you do not file it within 20 days, your opponent can go to court to compel you to discover. And the court will then tell you that you must within seven days or within a week or within 10 days after the court order, you must discover. If you still fail to discover, then your claim can be dismissed, can be struck. And that's the end of it. That is the that is the risk you're facing if you don't comply with the rules. With that even, specific rule. okay. Even if the other party doesn't go to court to apply for the case to be dismissed, it can still be dismissed. No, the other party must go to court. And if they don't, is the case still active? And you didn't dis discover? Yes. Yeah, do you remember, um, at, um, in the past there was a magistrate's court rule, which, which is no longer a rule, I think it was rule 10, that said that if you did nothing for a year on a summons, then it becomes a stale summons. So they, that rule doesn't exist anymore. So I think it depends on the court as to whether a summons is stale if nothing has happened in the matter. Um. So there is no rule like that to say that the matter is not alive anymore. But the party can go to court and will obviously um, have to give you an opportunity to then discover again. And if you still don't, then can go back to court and, and have the claim struck. Otherwise, it is still, like, there's nothing that say, nothing in the rules that say the matter is now, there's a stale summons and it's now an, it come, came to an end. There's nothing in the rules anymore. They used to be in the past in the magistrate's court rule. Okay, thank you. That's, That's what okay. I want to just find out. Yes, somebody okay. said. Advocates. Yes. Why, why did, oh, there's a, there was a particular case where the labor court directed the applicant to choose between application procedure and statement of claim. Yes. What is the what is the difference between the two? Well, well, in the labor court, the statement of claim is where you're going to um we we it's it's like this uh, this uh, um action procedure because you're going to call witnesses, and you're going to lead oral evidence, um and then in the application procedure, it's where you argue on the papers. So I don't know what the specific um specifics is of that case that you are referring to, but the court can um. In certain cases, order that the matter be one. Usually from from application to to um, action, because the parties may have chosen the wrong procedure. Okay. The court can the, the, that is one of the options one of that the court can do. But we'll we'll go into more detail with that when I get there. Yes. Okay. Right, so um, the question of Amaya, I think it was, when deciding to use the action or the application, you ask yourself these three questions. The first question that you ask, is the action procedure mandatory? Now, in some instance, you can only use the action procedure. You don't have a choice, right? And that is, um, for example, in a divorce, you don't get a divorce application. Divorce is always an action. If a claim is for damages, you don't get a, an application for damages. It is always an action. Then you would use the summons. You would use the action procedure. So if the answer is yes, it's mandatory, then you use the summons procedure, right? If the answer is no, the action procedure is not mandatory, then you ask yourself the second question, and that is, is the application procedure mandatory? Because in certain instances, you can only use the application procedure. For example, an application for sequestration, an application for the appointment of a curator, an application for the declaration of debt, an application for um, review. You can only use the application procedure. It's mandatory. And if it is mandatory, then you use the application procedure. That is the notice of motion and the affidavits. If the answer is no to that, then you ask yourself the third question. So if it is not mandatory to use the action procedure 
or to use the application procedure. This is now where your skills as a lawyer come in. The third question that you ask yourself is, can I foresee a real dispute of fact? Now, they say a real dispute of fact because obviously there is some dispute because that's why we're going to court. So even if I use the application procedure, there is going to be a dispute of fact. But now you have to determine whether this dispute of fact can be decided on the papers or would the court have to hear oral evidence in order to determine the dispute? So you will have to make that call. Can I foresee a real dispute of fact? If the answer is yes, I can foresee a real dispute of fact, then you must use the action procedure. Then it must be that you call witnesses. If the answer is no, then you may use the application procedure because you feel that the dispute of fact is not so substantial. It can still be decided on the papers without having to call witnesses to clear it up. If the answer is no, you can use the application procedure. OK, right. So you must now decide which you're going to use. And before we. Yeah, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you the action procedure. We're first going to start by doing the action procedure and then we're going to do application procedure. OK, so we're going to start with plaintiffs and defendants and um, summonses. Okay. Any questions so far? None? We're moving on. Right, so there are four stages to an action procedure, roughly four stages. There's the pleading stage. And during the pleading stage, we are defining the issues. We are determining what is it that we are fighting about. Remember, in your particulars of claim, you are going to set out what is the facts. And in the plea, which is what the defendant will file, he will set out what he agrees with and what is his opposition and what is his facts. So what are we fighting about? Right. In the second stage, we have the pre-trial stage. This is the preparation for trial, where we have discovery, pre-trial conferences, case management meetings, exchangement of evidence, all of that all the practical arrangements. And then the third stage is the trial where we place the evidence before the court by calling the witnesses. And then obviously we have the judgment where we have the decision of the court. There can even be a fifth stage, that is the execution of the judgment. Or the fifth stage can be an appeal and then the sixth stage execution of judgment if you want to, to have more. Right, so we, we now doing the action procedure, right? So at the pleading stage, that is what we call the argument stage. It's between two parties. Remember, in actions, they are called plaintiff and defendant. Now, the plaintiff will point by point in his particulars of claim, set out the facts, what it is that he's fighting about. And the defendant will set out his defense to the claim point by point in the plea. OK, particulars of claim plea. Replication, those are all called pleadings. Remember, the plea is a pleading, but not all pleadings are plea. Okay. okay, so there's three kinds of summonses. There's a provisional sentence summons, a simple summons, and a combined summons. The provisional sentence summons, now this, these summonses, they are annexures to the uniform rules. Okay. The provisional sentence summons is form three of the uniform rules. So you just fill in the details of, of your client. It's form three. The simple summons is form nine of the uniform rules. And the combined summons is form 10 of the uniform rules. And you would have in your manual, you have examples of a combined summons, a simple summons, and a, a provisional sentence summons. You will find on page 231, the simple summons, 231 of your manual. And you will find on um, the combined summons on the next page, 232. Right, And then these examples of particulars of claims, like I told you, just know where these things are if you're going to do your BBSD exam so that you know where to look. And then you will see on page 236, there's an example of a provisional sentence summons. Okay. They are forms 
part of the uniform rules, right? Now you use the provisional sentence summons yes. only in the case where the claim is based on a liquid document. Now it is important for you to know what a liquid document is in order for you to know if you can use the provisional sentence summons. The summons includes the particulars of claim and you will have the liquid document attached, right? I'm going to put that on the back burner for the while. I'm not going to deal with provisional sentence summons. I'm going to deal with it at the end of action procedure. What I'm going to concentrate on now is the simple summons and the combined summons. Now, a simple summons you would use for a claim for a debt or a liquidated demand. And a simple summons is exactly what the word says. It is just a summons. It, the, su the summons includes a summary of the particulars of claim. Okay. Now, all the summonses would have um, information that you would ask your opponent to give an address within 15 kilometers from the court where they will accept further processes in the matter, etc. Right. You would use a simple summons only in five instances. Right. And I'm talking, I'm talking off the top of my head. It, it will come up later. But in this, if the claim is based on a uh, it's for the debt or liquidated demand of money. That is the one. If it's for the transfer of um, immovable property, you can use a simple summons. It is, if it is for the delivery of specified movable property, you can use the simple summons. If it's for a cancellation of the contract, you can use a simple summons. And if it is for ejectment. And this is ejectment, eviction from a commercial property. Remember, if you want to evict people from a residential property, you must use the PI Act, the Prevention of Illegal Eviction and Unlawful Occupation Act. You must use that act. So this is commercial. You can use a simple summons in those five instances. The combined summons. So, so the simple summons would just be a summons. It's one document. And it has a summary of the particulars of claim on the actual summons on the document. Right. The combined summons you can use in all matters, even in the matters where you could have used the provisional sentence summons or the simple summons. You can use the combined summons. So you can use the combined summons in all matters if you're going to use the action procedure. The combined summons consist of the summons. And then it has a separate document, which is details of the particulars of the claim. So the combined summons, it's combined, consists of two documents. The summons, which is form 10, and a separate document called the particulars of claim. There are examples of particulars of claim on page, pages um, 230. Four and 235 and 233 also. 233 to 235, check examples of particulars of claim, right? Those are the three kinds of summons. Like I said, I'll be concentrating now on simple summons and combined summons, right? So the simple summons is issued for the, in these five instances. You cannot use the simple summons if you are claiming damages. Remember, the simple summons is one document. It's a simple summons. And it has a summary of the cause of action on it. Right? The combined summons may be used in all cases. And next to the summons is a document that sets out the material facts. Now, this is one of the differences between a combined summons and a simple summons. A simple summons that you can use in those five instances, which is just, and a simple summons is just one document, can be signed by an attorney. Right? A combined summons, the particulars of claim, must be signed by an attorney and an advocate. If an attorney signs a loan, he must have right of appearance in the High Court, and underneath his signature, he must certify that he has right of appearance in the High Court. Okay. Now, the simple summons, an attorney can sign a loan. You don't have to have right of appearance in the High Court. In the combined summons, if the attorney wants to sign, he can only sign if he has right of appearance in the High Court. 
and then he must certify. Then he can sign a loan. Otherwise, two people must sign it: an attorney and an advocate. That is in the combined summons. Right now, processes are issued from nine to one at most of the courts. It used to be you can go after one again after oh sorry after lunchtime again, but as I've heard from people. It is only from nine to one where you can issue it. Remember, issue is when they give it a case number, corresponding case number on the court file that they have opened in the matter. That is when you issue the process. And and and, and if the processes is either your summons or your notice of motion, though those are both processes and they are issued there. Once you have it issued, then you would take the original to the sheriff to go and serve on the defendant. Right. right now, the sheriff, we've done the sheriff as part of the officers of the officials of the court. So I'm just going to tell you more about him. Service may not be affected on a Sunday or a public holiday unless it's an interdict or a warrant for arrest or attachment to found or confirmed jurisdiction. Service by the sheriff must be as near as possible between. 7 a.m. in the morning and 7 p.m. at night. Improper service gives grounds for noting an exception. And then they say it's a criminal offense to obstruct the sheriff in the execution of his duties. You can get fined for 500 rand or six months in prison. Now, it is a cornerstone of our legal system that a person is entitled to notice of legal proceedings against him. We did this on our first night. Cornerstone of our legal system, the Audi Alteram Partem rule. The person must know legal proceedings are being instituted against you and what it is. Right. So the following processes usually is what the sheriff will serve. Yes, there's a question. Cool. Hey. Please put off your advocate. microphone. Okay. Is yes. there a question? Advocate. Sorry. Yes. yes. I want to ask a question, please. Yes, can you? You can ask. I don't see your hand, but you can. Oh, there I see your hand. Pule, Marema. Yes. Okay. Where does. Um, in the case of. Okay, there's some disturbance in the background. Can that person, whoever it is, put off the. Thanks. Thanks, advocate. Um, in the case of signing of particulars of claim, uh, you have indicated that the attorney must have the 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 call signs by the advocate. In the instance of a trust account advocate, what would be the position in terms of signing of the summons? Okay, you're asking me a tough question. I didn't. I never thought about that. Um, an attorney would would is there, would he need an attorney to sign? Because it's got nothing to do with the issue of trust account. That's correct. Uh, yeah, it's got nothing to do. He would still need an attorney to, to sign with him. Because remember, an advocate can never sign a loan. An attorney can sign a loan provided he has right of appearance in the high court. But an advocate mm -hmm. cannot sign a loan. An advocate, in fact, does not even sign a notice of motion. So um, whether a trust account advocate would be able to do that, I must confess I never thought about that. That's a very good question. So I don't I don't know the true answer, but I mean the trust the trust got to do with the with the fact that he can receive money because the money will be protected, but it's got nothing to do with this role as signing of that. So yeah, I don't know. Must he now find an attorney to co-sign? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. Does anybody <laughs> else? Can anybody else shed, shed some light on that? No. Okay. I, hello. Yes. I think he should be able to sign a loan because having a trust account as an advocate allows him to co uh, meet with the clients directly now. He doesn't mm. need an attorney to brief him on the matter. I hear what you are saying, but I mean, can Masi can he sign? I've never thought of it, you know. But I do know that this question came up. Can a trust account advocate um, qualify as a conveyancer because he has a trust account now? And the answer is no, because the court clearly say a conveyancer must be an admitted attorney and not an admitted legal practitioner. 
So maybe that falls into that category and it will probably change if somebody should challenge it in court and say, look here, I'm a trust account advocate. I also want the same rights as an attorney for this and that. I don't know. Yeah, it's a very good question. So you say it, it you, you you say the person who lost who spoke last says it should he should have the same powers that an attorney have in that regard. If I understood you correct. Because he's actually acting as if he's an attorney. Um advocate. Yes. Yeah, I just want to suggest something. My thinking should be uh, given that uh, an attorney who appears in the high court may not require uh, an, an advocate, advocate to sign, yeah. uh, the principle should apply in the case of a, an advocate with um, with, a, with 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 that account to with also account. do the same. Yeah, with it with a trust account, of course. Uh, as I understand it, one it allows that advocate to engage directly with clients, but then, mm. but the, then by the status of being an advocate, the same person has a capacity to appear in the high court. So my thinking would be, um, it should be allowed. And of course, if, if the rules currently may not allow now, I, I think if this matter were to be challenged in court, mm. uh, that advocate, it's, like would su be successful, matter. probably, eh? Yeah. Probably. Or probably doesn't even have to go to court. It can just, they can just amend the, <laughs> the, the act or to, to, to. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Um. There's another hand up. Bucket. Uh, please, I was talking about uh, particulars of claim. Um, and yes. the declaration. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we had particulars of claim is uh, associated with the uh, combined summons. Uh -huh. And then what of simple summons? The declaration. OK, I will come and explain that to you later on. But it's exactly the same document. It's just called differently because the one came about um, because the proceedings were started with the issuing of a simple summons, but it will become clearer later on. I will explain it to you. Okay, thanks. Okay. There's another hand. Uh, okay. Yes. My question is in relation to proceedings that are taking place at the regional court. Now, I hear you, you are saying an attorney who doesn't have a right to appear in the high court must co-sign with the advocate. But yes. in this case, he has got an appear, a right of appearance in the regional court. What is the situation with regard to combined summons? A regional court is... Um... <laughs> A regional court is a magistrate's court, um, but it is still a combined summons. Yes, we are talking about combined summons yeah. at the regional court level. Okay. I think an attorney signs alone. You don't. I don't think you have to have right of appearance in the high court to sign. Um, a process in the regional court because the regional court is not a high court. It is still part of the magistrate's court. The magistrate's court consists of the district court and the regional court. So okay, thank you. to sign processes in for the high court, you must have right of appearance in the high court. Um, a combined summons, a simple summons you can sign alone. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? None. Right, so these processes, it's all processes that is addressed to the sheriff to go and serve. It's a writ of arrest, a simple summons, a combined summons, a subpoena, a writ of execution of judgment, a writ of attachment of immovable property, a writ of commitment for contempt of court, 
and a writ of attachment at fundandum jurisdictionem, a, a, attachment to found jurisdiction. Right? Okay. And a notice of, yes. Uh, I'm just interested in number five here, yeah, this, this subpoena. Number five, subpoena, yes. Yes. Yes, I just got, I received the subpoena today. You if, received one? If uh, a subpoena to go to be a witness at the labor court, yeah. if I don't, or if I refuse to be a witness, what are the implications? What does the subpoena say? Because there is a sanction. I think it's a fine of 200 rand or something if you don't, if you don't go away. What does the subpoena say? It, it would, it oh, would tell you. Yeah, the form will tell you, uh, the Labour Court subpoena will tell you what is the sanction if you don't go because it is a, it is a, it is, it was it served by the sheriff? Yes. Yes, sheriff I, I would suggest you point. go. I mean, don't you want to give evidence? If my employer dismisses me or. <laughs> but are you a, a, a wit you are a witness are you not the, the person um i'm the witness for an applicant a fellow employee who was um was discriminated the, against uh, uh, so you must give evidence against the employer yes oh that's tricky eh? yes. <laughs> it's tricky i don't know what to it's say to challenge. you yeah, it's a difficult one. I just mm. has to go. Unfortunately, it does not have um, diplomatic uh, immunity. Immunity. <laughs> <laughs> um. Now, are you going to talk the truth, or are you going to? Um. That is the question. Are you going to be truthful in your evidence, or are you going to think of your job and and not say anything against your employer? Yeah, it's a moral I mean, question, eh? <laughs> yeah, it's a moral but, but, because but, in the papers. In in the Abidav, it's in the papers. My name is there. There are certain papers or letters that I used to write to the employer when I was still a shop steward. Now, okay. the lawyers of the applicant want me to go and talk to those particular letters. But I mean, if the, if the employer is going to hold it against you, that's victimization. You will have recourse. I mean, we don't yeah. want to go there necessarily, but I mean, you would have recourse and you can then if anything happens. So yeah. you'll just have to do stay in line then and don't do anything that they can use against you. <laughs> I, I, I also wanted to say so, Advocate, that uh, I think last year uh, the Department of Labor and Employment released a code of uh, good practice uh, on elimination and prevention of harassment in the workplace. So mm. if your employer uh, victimizes you, uh, in such circumstances where you have said the truth um, and maybe you lose your job in the process, uh, I think you, you may need to consider uh, that code and, and take a case against your employer. Uh, yeah, unless if maybe they can prove that you've lied, then that would be something else. But if you have said the truth and they arrest you or victimize you, then maybe take advantage of that code. Okay. Yeah, there's some good advice for you. <laughs> yes, I, I understand your predicament. You don't want this now in your life, <laughs> but but uh, you have to just deal with it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, any more questions? The, these are all processes that the sheriff serves, eh? Right. Oh, right. Yes, so, yes. Actually, advocate. That was my question. That are these the only processes that are. No. It's not oh. exhaustive. It's not an exhaustive oh. list, but it it is some of the processes that the sheriff would go and serve. But there are other things also, and even um, yeah, domestic violence. People use sheriffs to serve people. Yeah, you, obviously right. you pay the sheriff to go and serve processes. Right. Um, but the list is not exhaustive. Um, personal service is obviously the first choice. Personal service means service on the defendant or on the respondent, right? It's used whenever it is possible 
The other methods uh, you use is if the defendant is elusive or untraceable. If you can't find him or if he, he's never at home, then you would use one of the other methods. But the first choice would also always be personal service. And um, when the sheriff goes and serves, he hands the relevant documents to the defendant personally. Where the defendant is a child under some legal or under some legal disability, the process must be delivered to the guardian or the curator. The court practice is that personal service is required in divorce cases and when the attorney seeks to withdraw as the attorney of record. The attorneys, um, if a, a person has an attorney and the attorney withdraws from the matter, um, he must then, in the notice of withdrawal, give the personal address of his client so that, and then there must be personal service of any subsequent um, <coughs> pleadings on the, on the party. Um, Divorce matters and any matter for that purpose, um, which is going to affect where the relief that is sought in court is going to affect your status. For example, divorce, um, also an application for sequestration that's going to affect your status. So there must be personal service on the defendant or on the respondent in those instances. Right now. Um, the, you can't use one of the other methods. All right, so it becomes difficult, but there is a remedy um, if the person um, personal service is not not available or, or can't be done. Right, um, this is another um, way that the sheriff can serve. Leave a copy at the place of residence or business. You know, the sheriff can leave it in leave it in the letterbox or at on the door. Or at the place, or you can so leave it with a person that is there who is um, older than 16 or looks older than 16 to the sheriff. Um, if the person is apparently in charge of the defendant and apparently not younger than 16. Okay. And then service at the domicilium sitandi et executandi. Remember, this is the, what you've given. This is an address, address is domicilium, which has been chosen by a person often in a contract for the service of documents. Documents is sitandi, so address of documents and execution of judgments, et executandi. That's what it means, right? Once it is chosen, it permits service even if the person has left the premises. Since the aim of the election of such an address is to relieve parties of the duties to search for people in order to affect service. That is why they include it in all contracts to relieve you of having to go and look for them. Um, generally, the courts are reluctant to allow the use of domicilium addresses. When the plaintiff is aware that the defendant won't receive the notice of legal proceedings served at the domicilium address. Only if, the, if, the, if it can be shown in court that the defendant knew that the person is no longer at the domicilium, then the court will be reluctant. So they would generally be reluctant, but not as a rule or reluctant. Okay. If, 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 the defend, if the plaintiff is willful and he knows the building has been stripped there's nothing there it has been um thrown down and then that was a domicilium and they still go and serve there the court will be reluctant to allow that okay the um that 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 cuts into the question that was asked earlier what if the person has moved and um didn't leave a forwarding address remember you are if the and usually credit agreements would say if you move it is incumbent upon you to, in writing, provide the credit provider with your new address. Okay. The SCA has ruled that the court has a discretion whether to accept service. So the court can always, when the court looks at the return of service, that is the document that the sheriff completes, and the court is not happy with this way it was served, the court can say they don't accept that service, it is a bad return, and then they can order or direct that the matter, that the process be, re, be served again. Okay, so it's in the discretion of the court. Service on a company or a closed corporation, usually 
at the company's registered office or its principal place of business that is within the court's jurisdiction. It's usually handed to the responsible employee or affixed to the main door. Principal place of business means the chief place of business which is situated in the court's jurisdiction. This is not the same interpretation given to the phrase when used for the purposes of jurisdiction where the main management is. Okay, principal place is not necessarily the main. Jurisdiction, a company or CC is said to reside at its principal place of business, which is the main management and control of the company. Right, service on a partnership, a firm or a voluntary association. Process may be left at the place of business of the partnership with the person who is apparently in charge of the premises and apparently over 16. If there's no place of business, it may be served on a partner when acting against the partnership on a proprietor of a firm or a chairman or secretary of the voluntary association. Right. Service on local authority or statutory bo body. Processes must be delivered to the town clerk or the city manager, that is the local authority, or the mayor. Processes must be delivered to the secretary or member of the board if it's a statutory body. Service on two or more persons being sued in their joint representative capacities. It must be served on each person individually. You can't serve it only on the one and then say, okay, you are both deemed to be served. And in legal proceedings against the state or a province. This is not different to the municipal, to the local um, government. Um, the state or a province, the processes must be served on the office of the state attorney situated in the area of jurisdiction of the court out of which the process was issued. In Cape Town, that is the office of the state attorney is um, 122 Loop Street, Cape Town. In Johannesburg, it's corner of Kreis and what uh, Albertina Sasulu Street in Johannesburg, CBD. That's the only two I know. Services on prisoners can only be served after a copy has first been given to a person in charge of the prison. The head of the prison is then obliged to arrange that the sheriff hand the process to a specific prisoner. Right, so what happens? I said to you that in divorce proceedings and any proceedings that's going to affect the status of the defendant or the respondent, there must be personal service. Now, what happens if personal service is not possible? Person comes to you and says, I want to divorce my husband. He left me 10 years ago. I want to remarry, so I need to divorce him, but I don't know where he is. What can you do? You can apply to court for substituted service. When I say apply to court, listen to the word apply. It's you bring an application. So it will be a notice of motion and an affidavit. And you ask the court then to allow you to serve by way of substituted service because personal service, which is required, is not possible. Right. Now, this is ordered when the defendant is believed to be in the Republic. And one of the normal forms of service set out in the rules cannot be affected. Now, in your affidavit that is um, attached to the notice of motion, you must show the court that it has jurisdiction in the matter and also show the court that you have a prima facie case and that the whereabouts of the defendant are unknown. But you must also state what steps you have taken to ascertain where the defendant is. So you can say you've looked all over, you've spoken to family members, you've appointed tracing agents and to no avail. This person is just missing and you can't find him. And then you must suggest you can be creative as a lawyer. You suggest to the court a way that you think reasonably that form of service that you suggest will reach the defendant. So you can say anything. If the person is active on social media and you clear it, him, you must obviously print out and say, this is what the person looks like now. This is how the person is. Um, and you want to suggest that they serve it on maybe the direct messages or inbox, whatever it is called. 
you can suggest that to the court. You must just convince the court that this person will receive it if it is served in this way. Remember in the past, it used to be published in a newspaper where the person last resided. Now you can, with social media, you can be more creative than that and suggest to the court. And once the court gives you um, permission, you'll have to come back and show what you have done, all the proof and printouts of what you have done. And then it is um, as if the person was personally served. And then you can go on with your action. Okay. High Court Rule 4A, capital A, permits subsequent document to be served electronically. Right? So the first process, remember, must always be served by the sheriff. Any process or documents after that can be served by messengers or you can email it. It's, it's allowed to email documents. Right? The sheriff then completes a return of service. And that is prima facie evidence of the matters they instated. So the sheriff will say he served it on so and so, ostensibly older than 16 years old, and the name of the person, or, or whatever the sheriff done, he will say in the return of service what he had done. And we'll sign the return of service, and he mustn't be vague, because then it will be a bad return. And remember, the court has the discretion to decide whether it's going to accept a service. Right. Um, so now you know how to issue. If you, we're using the action procedure. We're now busy with the action procedure. You've decided in your consultation that you're going to, you have to use the action procedure. It can either be because it's mandatory or because it's a, just a real foreseeable dispute of fact. And you've used the action procedure, right? Now, when you are going to draft, you're going to draft like this. And um, the information as to how to draft in the High Court, you'll find in Rule 18, that is the most important rule for drafting. It tells you what the headings would look like. The court out of which you are going to issue, which shows that you know which court has jurisdiction to hear the matter. We'll have the case number. You usually leave a space open for where the registrar will write in the case number when you go and issue it. In the matter between, and then you have the name of the parties, Peter Adams, plaintiff, and John Smith, the defendant. Then you have the two lines, which they refer to as tram lines. And in between those lines, you'll have the title of the document. If it's a particular soft claim, it's a declaration or a plea, or if it's a notice of motion, or if it's an affidavit, the title will be written there. Sorry, it can't be an affidavit for the plaintiff and defendant. But between the tram lines, you'll have the Right. Um, so after that, um, after the heading, you will start by citing the parties. Now we looked at the citation of a minor where we talked about locus standi and the minor under seven and older seven and with the father sue in his own capacity as well as on behalf of the minor. Now you usually would start by identifying the parties and you start with the plaintiff first. And you must use the correct citation. Now, Rule 17 of the High Court, the Uniform Rules, deals with citations. The plaintiff, you must have the full names of the plaintiff, the gender, the occupation, and the address. Okay. Um, rule 70 says with the defendant, you will have the name by which the defendant is known to the plaintiff, the gender, and occupation if known. So with the plaintiff, you need to have the full names because you're drafting it on behalf of the plaintiff. He's there, he can tell you. The plaintiff may not know the full details of the defendant. He can tell you, okay, um, the defendant, I only know him as Mr. Brown. I don't know what his first name is. Then you will say the defendant is Mr. Brown, an adult male, and maybe you don't know what his occupation is. Then you will say whose full and further particulars are unknown to the plaintiff. But you can't say that in with regards to the plaintiff because you would have all of those details. The plaintiff is your client. Okay. I've had some heavy debates in the past with classes about gender and um, non-binary and binary. Um, the rules is not, does not yet make provision for that, but I'm sure if you want to put something else than male and female, you could probably do that. I don't think anybody will say it's incorrect. Yeah. 
we'll still get there. They'll probably still amend the rules one day. Right, then joinder of parties. You can have more than one plaintiff or more than one defendant. Parties who have a direct and substantial interest in any order the court might make in proceedings should be joined. This means that if you are going to bring an application or an action, and we are busy with actions now, but I'm speak that this applies to applications as well where there's more than one party. If a party's rights are going to be affected, you're going to approach the court and you're going to ask the court to give relief. And the relief that the court, that you're asking of the court, may affect other people's rights as well. Remember the Audi Alterum Partem? That person must be afforded an opportunity to come to court to say why his or her rights should not be affected. So that party should be joined. That is what we call compulsory joinder. And then rule 10 deals with compulsory joinder. That is parties who have a direct and substantial interest in any order the court might make in proceedings. They should be joined. If you had to join a person and you did not join that person, then the defendant can raise a special plea and say, Mr. X should have been joined because Mr. X have this right. In the outcome, this is the relief that is sought. It will affect Mr. X's right. Mr. X should be here to defend that right. Therefore, um, yeah, that party should have been joined and is not joined. And then the um, plaintiff will then have to make an application to join the party that they did not join in the beginning. Okay. So parties who have a direct and substantial interest in any order the court might make should be joined, that is compulsory joinder. You also get a joinder for convenience, a joinder of convenience, sorry. A joinder of convenience is where the issues in dispute between the parties is basically the same and the parties just join in the same action because they have more or less the same matter and the relief they seek is the same, the law and the facts are the same and it, it, it um, saves time and costs. So you can get a joinder of convenience as well, but obviously you can't say that somebody must be joined for convenience and erase that as a special plea. But you can say that the person must be joined because they have a direct and substantial interest in any order that the court might make. I'm going to give you an example just to make it more clear as to um, when a party have a direct and substantial interest. Say, for example, you are claiming that a house was sold illegally to somebody. And it's now registered in this new person's name illegally. It's your house and this other person should not have sold it. So you sue this person now for having sold the house illegally. But if the court makes the order that that has been sold illegally, remember the new owner's rights is also going to be affected. So he should also be given an opportunity to come to court and know about his rights that is going to be affected and defend that right if he wants to. Do you see where? Where it comes in. Right, you, a plaintiff may also join several causes of action in the same action. Now remember, we did cause of action. What is a cause of action? It's a set of facts that give rise to a claim. Now you can have different causes of action in the same action, where you have claim one and it's a different cause of action in terms of this contract. This is what the breach of contract. Two in terms of this contract, that is the breach of contract. It's different causes of action because it's because of... Uh, yes? Yeah, what I want to find out um, with regards to the joinder of convenience, where yes. a, a, a party who has interest in a matter and was not actually cited and there was judgment, you know, that uh, the judgment also affect the rights of that individual. What recourse do they have? What recourses do they have? Well, the court won't give an order if it's going to affect an individual um, if that party has not been joined. Um, but you say it, it happens so that the court makes an order which is going to affect the rights of a person who's not before the court. Yes. I think the court will be remote to say, but he can't give an order that's going to affect the rights of, of, of a person who's not before him. But that person would, would, if it's going to affect that person's right, that person can, 
What can that person do? The court Life can't variation. give an order against you if you if you're not in court. Yeah, but if yeah. it depends, because um, you know, I know of a case where you know a, a judgment was taken where the the right of the other parties were affected, you know, by the same course of action, you know, and then um, they were not served by sheriff, you know. Um, but was it was it was it a similar or the same? There's a difference. Was it the exact same cause of action? Or was it a similar cause of action? Same cause of action. Same, the same facts. Yes. And they weren't served. They weren't joined as parties. They, they were cited, but then they were not actually given the, uh, um, the, uh, the summons. Oh, so there are parties, but they but they didn't receive the summons. Yes. Okay, so 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 they it's not that they weren't joined. It's that they would did, but if they were parties, why were they not? Why did because if if there are more than one party that's being sued, each one must be served individually. Yes. So the recourse that they have is they can apply for the rescission of that judgment because they weren't served. That is, if they can prove that they weren't served, and they would have defended had they been served, and they do have, um, uh, they would do have a good chance of successfully defending. Whatever the the action is, they can they can apply for rescission of the judgment if they weren't served. But they are parties, so they were joined, but they were not served. They were not but served. how would how would that then? How would the court? Because there must be return of service, and and the return of service will indicate that each and every party has been served. And if the court doesn't see that, the court shouldn't make an order against those people. Uh, the court made that order, but then the other party, when they actually raised, you, you, you know, the application for rescission, I, I think the, 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 uh, uh, the other party co uh, raised a rule 30, you know, and said that, uh, you know, the action was an irregular step. Okay. Hmm. Um, uh, the action was an irregular step. What was it about? Um, yeah. It, it, it was a matter where, you know, it was a matter of, of, of eviction, you know, in a site where people were actually, you know, building, you know, and then um, the, 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 the contractor was also part of the project, you know, and then they wanted to evict the main member for certain reasons, you know, and then they cited the, the contractors who also were working on, on, on site. You know, and then, but then for some reason, you know, a sheriff didn't actually, you know, serve them, you know, and then judgment, they, they, they actually um, went for an agent application, I think, where, you know, the other party was served uh, two days before the actual action, you know, and then the court, um, you know, uh, ruled uh, to the favor of the applica applicants, nevertheless, you know, but then when the, uh, the, other, the, the other party were affected and were not served, uh, you know, raised, I wanted to apply for a senior judgment, you know, and then the the other party raised a rule 30 and said that it was an irregular step. To 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 to, to apply for rescission? Yes. But, um, okay, so sometimes it do happens that the court will give an order where all the parties has not been notified, but the order that the court would give in those circumstances would be an interim order and not the final order. The court yes. will then issue what they call a rule nisi or what mean, means a return day where the parties yes. can then come to court and say why the interim order that the court gave in their absence should not be made a final order. So is yes. that not perhaps what happens here? And they can't rescind an interim order because it's not yet final. They should rather go on the return day and they can even anticipate an earlier return day yes. and, and, and make their own date and come to court and then say why that is that interim order should not be made a final order. Is that not maybe what, what we are dealing with here? Rule nice eye. Hey? It was a rule nice side. Yeah, it, yeah. So you, so yeah. The, the, it was right. They can't a, a rule nice. It's an interim order then that was granted. So they must rather anticipate an earlier return day, which they can do within twenty four hours of having received the order. 
So they yes. can go to court and then they can say why the order, the interim order should not have been granted and why it should not become a final order. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. okay. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Right. Is there still a hand or is that the same hand? Right. So if, if parties are joined, they are called co-plaintiffs as plaintiffs. And if they are joined as defendants, it's co-defendants. Right. Um, so that is how you would cite co-plaintiffs and that is how you would cite. Um, so and sometimes you, uh, especially in, 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 in eviction applications, which is applications, you would find pages and pages full of respondents if it is a, a whole area that um, there's a lot of illegal occupants that is that eviction is being applied for, there would be pages and pages full of defendants. So there's not a limit on how many plaintiffs and how many defendants there can be. There can be as many as there are. Right, there's a hand still. Is that the old hand? Uh, yes, advocate. That's me. Okay. Yes, Um. just a quick question with regards to citation of parties in yes. your summons so or application. So... <clears throat> You said that if you don't know the the full particulars of your opponent, the defendant, yes. in this instance, you can just write uh, perhaps the name that he is that known you know by. by. Yeah. Yes. Now, isn't it going to create a problem at the later stage where now you you receive the uh, an, a judgment, and now you have to execute? Let's say, for instance, you want to attach bank accounts, and now the the bank says no. We don't. We don't have this person in our system, and perhaps you only have his his name, like a nickname. You don't have a, a full name as per the identity document. Because there is a similar case like that. The banks are saying no. We cannot attach the bank accounts because we don't know. We don't have this person in our in our system. Yeah, if you're going to if you're going to bring an application for banks accounts that must be attached or, or that must be frozen or, or something, then then you must be then you must have the name of the person, the full name, because you must if, if the bank is going to be because then you're going to also have the bank there that's going to be ordered by the court to freeze that bank account. But if the bank um, can't be given the name of the bank account that it must be frozen in that they, there's no jurisdiction because you can't give effect to that order. That is why in those kind of cases, you need to know the full names of the party. All right. Yeah, you, you would in any event need the address of the, of the defendant. So if it is served on the defendant and um, yeah, you need, but let's if it's say, like for say. bank account, which is specific, the, if the bank can't, don't know who, what bank account to freeze, what is the purpose of the whole order then? No, let's say, for instance, um, initially the the judgment was given in absence of of the, the party. Let's say it was, um, let's say default judgment or just the, 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 the defendant or rather the respondent didn't oppose the application. And then the the judgment was given in in their absence, and now you need to execute. Yeah, was it served on them? Was it the right address? It was. It was served. But now you don't have the correct name, and you only have yes. the nickname. Yes. So the court actually gave an order against a person whose real name is unknown. It's, yeah, it's, it's look, unknown. It's, it's, it's what? It's, it's what? Name. It's, it's the what? name that is known. Yes, that is known of. But this actual name is on the identity document, mm, which was yeah. which was not placed on the on the pleadings initially. Can and we just write a letter? Yes, can we just write a letter to the sheriff or the the relevant institution and say no? This is who this person actually if is. We, and if, if you are later on find out the correct name you can apply yes. for substituting the name with the correct name so you have to apply in court yeah you can do that you can amend and say this is the this is the real name you can amend that advocate right. advocate yes. you don't you don't wear today may i propose we 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 come again tomorrow 
No, no, I was looking at the time now, but I'm yeah. just I'm just addressing the questions because I wasn't going further. I was just yeah. if people have questions, I'm I'm addressing that. But I, I, for those of you who don't have questions, we are officially done for the evening. Sorry for that yeah. seven minutes extra. You don't worry. Today. Thanks a lot. OK, thanks. OK, no, bye. OK, thank you. I'll see you everybody tomorrow. I don't see any more hands. I'll see everyone tomorrow. Have a good evening, Advocate. Yes. Thank good you, evening. Advocate. You must come and defend me. <laughs> and then play <laughs> charges me. <laughs> Yes, Pule Marema, you want to ask something? No, 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 it's an old hand. Um, thanks, thanks, Advocate. Okay, thank you. Advocate, I want to ask something <laughs> quickly. Sure. Yes, um, it, it's it's uh, relating to uh, the appearance, the court appearance. I had some, I read somewhere today there was this other guy who was uh, he was a prisoner. So he came while he was in prison. He did um, a Bcom, um, not a Bcom, an LLB, and then he was saying that he later he went. After, while he was doing his article, he represented himself at the High Court. How true is that? Look, a, people, a person can always go to court in person. It's not a requirement that you must, it's advisable, but it's not a requirement that you must be legally represented. So you, you're not there as a lawyer, you're there in person, in persona, they say. So a person can oh. always go to court unrepresented. You represent yourself. But you know the word, oh. the, the saying goes, eh? It is a, a what is they say? It is a fool who, uh, who have his, who's his own attorney, something like that. A person who does, who is his own attorney is a fool. Something like that. <laughs> I don't know the correct saying. But it's not oh. advisable. Yeah, you can appear in person. And I mean, if you oh, have an LLB, that... you'll take your chances, eh? But you're not there. You don't put on legal clothes. You go there as a lay person. You don't put on oh. your, your gown and say, I represent myself if you don't have right of appearance and that. You're oh, there in okay. persona. But even at the high court level? Eh? Yeah, at the high court, this uh, people do it every day. They come there, they know the matter is being heard. They come there, they say, I don't have a lawyer, but I want to represent myself. You can't chase them away. They have the rights. If you, you can't force, if they don't have money for a lawyer, you can't say, now you can't come to court. Oh, okay. Mm. Okay. Okay. No, that's understandable. Thank you very much for your clarity. Okay. Anytime. Okay, bye. I'll leave you now. It, I, I, I presume there's not going to be more questions. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Okay.